ダラディーンダラディーン Right and so hello everyone welcome to the Finnish war one of those more interesting little wars which gets forgotten because well it's kind of subsumed into the Napoleonic wars as you can see it lasted 1808 to 1809 and I can tell you now one of the combatants in our in it is not Finland in fact, neither of the combatants in it are Finland, except in the most tangential sense. In the fact that at one point, well, you can argue it is Finland because they're part of the... Uh, the um, I'm out of iron brew. Out of the Swedish Empire. But there's also Finns fighting for, they think, independence, thanks to the Russian Empire. And they get a sort of independence. Where they become a or sort of, and I say sort of, self-governing state within the Russian Empire. How much iron brew have I got through this week? There's a lot of court bags around me. That suggests I've had more than one delivery already. That's only Thursday. Okay. Uh, I might need to have the talk to that addiction specialist after all. There again, let's be honest, it's far, far cheaper than being addicted to anything else, so, yeah, keep it going. Right then. Hello, Night Six, everyone. There seems to be an argument going on about Blackburn, Blackburn already. We have managed to go a few months without the Blackburn, Blackburn cropping up, and I was sort of quietly just hoping the cult had disappeared a little bit. I was... Just gone back, gone to the recesses of Discord, the Discord server, but no, it has returned. It has returned. Oh. I'm gonna have to someday. I'm gonna have to do this, the whole academic exorcism on the Blackburn Blackburn, and write an actual academic paper on it. The Blackburn Blackburn and what it tells us about naval aviation strategy and operational technology, operational thinking in the early 1920s Royal Navy. Right then. Hello, Carmen Gersberg. Hello, John Shea. Hello, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> Stephen Richards. Hello, Matthias Stavik. Hello, Roman Cash. Hello, George Newman. Hello, Sage. Hello, DG40. Hello, Trust Burden. Hello, Dirt Squad. Hello. <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, hello, Dan Freeman. <laughs> Good lord. Um, yeah, uh, hello Stafford. Hello, yeah, at this rate, I'm gonna end up being made, met in Canada by a Blackburn Blackburn, aren't I? They're gonna somehow have one in one of the uh, one of the museums there. Um, if they don't, Stafford Thompson will have built one out of wood and string and canvas by the time I get there. That's good. I suppose the USN, uh, USN saw the news that the Russian Navy had responded to the loss of the USS Bonham Richards with burning down the Moscow and felt they needed to up the stakes to ships breaking up. I hope not. Look, the LCS has issues, but that's far and beyond this one. This was a this. There is a reason why. Sometimes when I have a lot of modern stuff creaking on around me, I take a few hours off and descend into the 19th and occasionally the 18th and sometimes the 17th century. Occasionally I go back even further and go to something like the 3rd and 4th centuries BC because, or BCE, or whatever we want to call them these days. Um, it really doesn't bother me. It should, I know. There are so many things that, 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 that people tell me they should bother me, and I just go, honestly, the price of milk bothers me more. I'm, I'm, I'm sure it has matters, and I will call it whatever anyone else calls it, but I'm not going to get involved in the debate. Hello, Felix B. Hello, Abzatki. Hello, Andrew Ben. Hello, Andrew Paul. Hello, Paul from Chicago. So we have three. Oh, the Ammon's on. We have Paul, we have Stafford, and we have Dan. Hello. Oh, good. So, Napoleonic Wars weren't finished. They were... The, the, the Finnish War was part of them, in a way. Um, it was... 
how do I put this politely? So, Finland wasn't at war with France, but we'll get into the causes. And it's it's fun. It's really quite fun. It's Russia throwing its weight around for a different point of history. That never happens, does it? Uh, hello, Paul P Peter Hurry. <laughs> As a, as a Finn, today's topic is especially interesting. Well, I thought I'd put this on because, again, it's one of the wars which people don't know much about, but actually it's quite interesting. And I'm not going to do every single battle because there are quite so many of them. But So, what have we got coming up? Well, we've got Canada com a Canada trip coming up. Um, especially Wayne and Stafford are looking into and sorting out the dinner with the Canadian fans on the 4th. And there's, pro there's probably going to be more dinners added in. Honestly, some of those lectures look like they're going to be turned into dinner events, which... Me and Drac have no qualms about. Frankly, if they turn into dinners, we're happy to have dinner with everyone. And it's the same. We haven't got anything scheduled for any of the either of the evenings we're in Canada in Halifax. So, if anyone sort of in the Halifax area would like to meet up, please suggest restaurants. We'll probably be there and eating. Um, uh, basically, you can get me and Drac pretty much anywhere if there's food, and if there's Iron Brew as well as food, we'll be there early. But no, it's looking like it's going to be a very nice trip and a lot of fun and a lot of interesting stuff to look at. And this was this week's, this month's suggestions for patron questions. Now, some of you who are patrons will know that the suggestions have gone live in an adapted form, i.e. the first 15 have. Broadly speaking, once it got to 15 and everyone had put in one... That is where I cut it off. Mainly because it was at 15 questions and I only have 89 patrons. I love you all. It's very kind of you. I think that's 89. I think that's roughly right. Uh, I'll have to. I'd have to actually double check that. He says. Quickly go, logging into Patreon and just checking. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Yeah, I have 89 active patrons. That's very kind, but my theory was at 28, if I gave you all 28 questions, knowing that all of you, you'd end up voting for all 28, and then I'd be really, 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 really overrun. So I went for, right then, you're getting, you're getting 15 of them, but they are some really cool questions. We have, you know, it's one of the things. I was very lucky. There are some very, very cool questions. Um... Bolton, there's, of course, torpedo developments, 1900 to 1939, and its impact on destroyer design and doctrine. Uh, Bichon's history of survey ships in the Royal Navy. Angenor's the conception, evolution, and use of land-based aircraft of target naval vessels. Sounds pretty cool. Paul from Chicago, Old Nick, the life and anger, angers of John Jarvis, Lord St. Vincent. Pretty darn cool, that one. Uh, Aaron Evans, the perfect operation, the 1862 capture of New Orleans. Always worth an, inter uh, always worth an interesting look. Uh, Glenn Stewart's Cruiser and Cruiser Actions of the Spanish-American War, which is another again. Richard Kirk, Die of Destroyers in the Aegean, Dodecanese Campaign, 1943. Greg Wake, Royal Navy Involvement in the Russian Civil War, e.g. HMS Ajax in the Black Sea. Uh, Shashank Nayan, uh, Japanese Aircraft Carrier Submarines, What Were They Thinking? Merits and Demerits of the Approach. James Carroll's Thrawn 2, Thrawn Tries for London. Ian Carr, illustrious and implacable class carriers, original ideas, developments, and service. And Carlman Gasberg's Diesel Kriegsmarine, the Weimar Republic of Nazi Germany never wanders into higher pressure steam propulsion, pursues instead of uh, diesel and diesel electric portion of all things. Uh, Samuel Spratt, Battle of Sinop, 1853. Everyone likes destroying a fleet in port. They always do. Carl ha ha Hanshaw, What If Somerville had launched a night attack against the Japanese during Operation C, and Wayne Borian's. I didn't actually put that one in, although that is number 15. I actually transferred in Wayne Borian, in depth in comparison of the strategic, economic, and infrastructure concerns driving the designs of the new warships in the Royal Navy, Royal Australian Navy, Royal Canadian Navy, Royal New Zealand Navy. How do the requirements impact of a deployment decisions, long term procurement act? How do you think the current war in Ukraine may inspire changes to the current programs? And there are more. Please take a look at them all. These are the questions. This is the quality of questions you were giving me. It's one of the things I love about this. And I, 
there is a reason I'm doing this as I'm doing this. First of all, I'm apologizing because I actually thought I made this go live on Monday and I hadn't, so that's on me. I do apologize. Uh, secondly, I had an interesting conversation with, well, tangentially with a colleague. This may or may not explain my future employment at that particular university. But um, we were talk we ended up we were talking about public facing academia, as I call it, or academia which actually interfaces with the public and the wider history, uh, wider audience. And I pointed out that I do patron, and I put up I I let the, my patrons suggest the questions, and they were most shocked. In fact, they thought it an absurd. Ab uh, they uh, let us try. They saw it as an absurd abdication of my responsibility as an academic. And I was sort of going, "Why?" And the question carried on, and it was an interesting conversation. Basically, it boiled down to this: in their minds, only academics know how to properly structure questions. Well, if they happen to ever watch any of my videos, which I doubt they will do, I hope they watch this one, and I hope they look at these questions because. Those look pretty well constructed to me. Maybe I'm biased, but they do to me. And we also have Sean, so we I think we do have all the mods. The only other mod out there is Drac, who I don't and I don't think and um, Drac and. I'm trying to remember now because I keep wanting to call him by his his normal name, not his mod name. And I uh, and cyclic, uh, if that's what he goes by publicly. Um, cyclic and Draca are the only ones I don't think who are on here tonight. All right then. <laughs> then. I think you might need that word with the addiction sessions about the book problem. <laughs> no, I don't have that. Look, my the the specialist who dealt me talked to me about the book problem, who was a very nice one, who's supported by pen and sword, told me actually the solution to the book problem was to have more books. So that's what they have. They keep sending me books. And these ones aren't even exchanged for money. These ones are just sent to me to review. These are going to be part of um, Sunday's brew ships. And yes, for those wondering what this is actually behind me, that is a squirrel holding up a giant fluffy torpedo. A small fluffy red squirrel holding up a giant fluffy torpedo. We'll leave that to one side and let your minds go with that where they may. So anyway, they had the gut, T rid of it because, uh, get rid of it because the wrong name would have been too overpowered. <laughs> hello, Rip hello, Colin Cameron, hello, um, hello, Colin Cameron, hello, um, <laughs> Stafford, uh, if I had the garage I want, yes, I would build the my plane for your rival. <laughs> Oh, not necessary, but very kind. That's good. It's uh, it's not a problem. It's a library. <laughs> Hello, Ollie Al. I'm standing near it because Black Moon Batman is better surveillance than all the spice I like to put together. That's <laughs> Sage. LCS has issues? No, Doctor, it's got cracks. It's got a lot of cracks. Let me be papered over. That's good. What if the Halifax restaurant is a vegetarian restaurant? If they serve Iron Brew, me and Drac will walk in, drink the Iron Brew, and leave. We'll drink them out of Iron Brew. We will rescue the Iron Brew from the vegetarian restaurant. Ryan Cash, mentioning Canada has made the Mrs. Ears pick up and cry maple syrup biscuits. <laughs> well, you know. I'm currently taking orders of food to take over to Canada, so I presume at some point someone will be giving me orders of food to bring back from Canada. 
Sure, Mike. So the dinner plans aren't formalized yet for the can trip. Um, the only dinner that's been formalized is the, in terms of, we know it's happening and definitely it's happening is on the 4th of the uh, 4th. That, what can I say? The talks are, I'd like to do them and I'm, the, some of the organizers are very keen on them, but some of their organizations are not so keen on doing public lectures at the moment because they're worried about COVID. And they're worried about all those sorts of things. And I sit there and go, well, we're back doing them, but yeah. It's there's also we're just that's just a whole pile of emails. <laughs> no, yeah, if the A2D, A2D Shirtshark had worked, then Sky Raider wouldn't have lasted long. Hmm. I, don't, I can ask academic questions, it's just not about naval history, but something like that I can do. Uh, yeah, academics are interesting. Some academics are interesting. Well, I was, the, the, I was sitting there having talked to Zach, this particular colleague. And the head of the department was sitting behind me, giggling away. And I ended up talking to the head of the department, and it was basically a case of, yeah, well, you see, that's why in the end we're going to end up not having funding. Because that sort of thinking leads to academics only talking to themselves, which means no one wants to fund academia or support academia. Because ultimately, academia gets its money from selling books, in my case, books, YouTube videos, patron, general support, and all sorts of everything from all of you, but also from teaching. The only money I get from teaching is because people choose to study that topic. They don't choose to study that topic usually because they're already interested in that topic because other people like me have already spoken to them. Or through the medium of television or something. The frigates versus cruiser question is missing from the poll. Glenn, I I know, Glenn, I know. It's the, the, there are fifteen questions which have made it to the poll. Okay, there were twenty eight questions I put in, one from everyone, and for yours I literally flipped a coin. Hello, Melly sixty forty. Hello, Glenn. Hello, Darius. Hello, everyone. The only place that can feed my partner and I in Hamilton is vegetarian. We wouldn't suggest that. Yeah. <sighs> Although I have added your requests to Stafford, so Stafford is hunting things. <sighs> right. So. Daniel, speaking of food, have you looked at the picture I sent you on Discord a few days back? Not yet, no. Um, I've been recording. Both me and Drak are currently busy recording videos. I have, and um, I can pull up a quick slide, and I'll pull it up quickly. Um, do, 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 do. If I go this way through here. Yeah. So, I am currently recording, before I go away, all of May's videos, of course. But also, all of those videos you can see there for the first part of June, up until, well, June the 16th, and actually June the 21st one I'm doing as well, before I go away, to make sure they're all done, so that you definitely have some good videos for while I'm wandering. And as I said, I will be doing lives when I can, in the evening, so it, it could be good, it'll be good. Did I get a message today, a Facebook message today with the update on Sullivan's? Uh, probably, but haven't opened it. Went through it. Mmm, bison burgers. <laughs> oh. Moose burgers, good. Okay. <laughs> Oh yeah, in regards to academics phrasing questions, I asked a few questions about anthropology and geography to my lecture in regards to conservation and completely forgot to factor in humans. Don't worry, life happens.
Nice error. Maybe the other 13 should be the June poll. But if you want to resubmit them for the June poll, you're more than welcome. I might actually, I'm going to nick some of the ideas. As I said, I'm already, I'm working on a couple. I've got, I've got about eight various ones which have failed to get through for the votes, which are sitting in a folder, which are being slowly worked on and will appear as extra specials at some point, because I'm hoping to have almost a video a day coming out over December. Uh, yeah, Glenn, it sounds like, uh, like Lynn Stewart just said, as he said this, um, um, his partner can't have food prepared in the kitchen that's not completely gluten-free. My sister's exactly the same. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we have to be quite so careful at my house, and also why it's quite easy when I'm on a no bread, no potato, no nothing, no pasta diet, For uh, <clears throat> thanks to one of my employers, because frankly, I'm not allowed them at the house anyway. Anyway, so let's start off with the actual, let's get into the actual topic, shall we? Um, I'm going to put a note on it, a, a note on the, the video. There we go. That should be good. Finish War Theatre of Operations. And yeah. There should now be some nice sort of things appearing below that allow people to navigate to the point at which they want. So here is roughly the Theatre of Operations. Yes, they do get a bit over this side as well. Thanks to the joy for our lovely Sweden. But uh, this is basically what you have. You have Sweden, Finland and Russia. And the war is over, Finland. Um, currently, well, Russia is supported by Napoleonic France and Denmark, Norway. And the reason they are supported by them is because, well, there's the Fifth Coalition going on. There's also the Anglo-Russian War of 1807 to 1812 which goes on, and this war, of course, takes place 1808 to 1809, so right slam back in the middle of the Anglo-Russian War, and there's also the Second Battle of Copenhagen happened. So, um, th th there are issues going on in this region at this point. It's one of those things. It... There are areas in this world who get fought over because they are the places you're using to go places. There are areas in this world which are fought over because they're useful for if you have to fight other people. And there are areas which get swept up into conflicts because they are next door to where those conflicts are going to be. The big conflict at this point is France. Anglo -Fr the Anglo-French conflict and the whole Napoleonic Wars really goes on around that. And Russia is Alexander the First Russia, which is let's put it this way: if you think that Putin has in any way, and current Russia has in any way had a logical and pragmatic foreign policy rather than in any way think it's going to feel logical and pragmatic as a foreign policy rather than being let's put it this way more reactionary and taking advantage of events and then casting them in a good light afterwards which actually tends to be most foreign policy these days then frankly in comparison in comparison well let's put it this way how do I put this? Alexander the First foreign policy in comparison to Putin's 
well, Putin's looks logical in comparison, looks logical, pragmatic, and well thought through in comparison to Alexander the First. Alexander the First actually, and you can argue this war happens because he has intelligence already in Finland. He's trying to gather information. He wants to take it off Sweden, and he basically says to the Swedish king. You either abide by the rules of the treaty which I've agreed with France, which you weren't part of, or I invade you. Let me freeze together. Now, I'm not saying Gustav the Fourth is in any way a smart guy, and we're going to be getting into this full expression in a second, but the war starts when the Russians invade Sweden the Swedish territory of Finland. And the war start, the reason for war is because the treaty negotiated between Alexander I and Napoleon and enforcing the continental system against Sweden and a Sweden's ally, Britain. So basically, the Russians were turning around to the Swedes and saying they had to follow a treaty which they hadn't signed and force rules against their ally or they would invade them. Now, Sweden is not a massive army. They've had a large empire. At this point, they still control parts of Germany. Stralsund. But they do have pride. And the thing is, if they'd agreed to Russia's, uh, Russia's demands, Alexander's demands, speaking as an example, Alexander, when I was acting like an immature little child, I a baby, and I was issuing such demands. Uh, so, basically, when I had man flu a few months ago. Joke. Luckily, I have grown out of that, but anyway. Um, it would have been a case of, you give me an inch, I will take a, 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 a frigating mile. And that's pretty much what Sweden realised. But Sweden didn't really exactly understand their own situation. Hmm, <sighs> man. Sure, Mike. Academics only talking about how you get certain of ideas, like the idea that academia is a malevolent force undermining society. <sighs> that would be strange. That would be not unusual. Academia really doesn't. Honestly, it can't undermine society. It's not that organized. I love it, but it's really not that organized. <laughs> right. Glenn Stewart. Oh, that's nice. Da, 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 da. Okay. Yeah, and um, just on the subject of C-Lexing, um, one of my... One of my best friends, her... Celiac. She's a Celiac as well. She's actually the one I'm man of honour for at the upcoming wedding. Um, hers is at the level at which she has to have radi regular radiation treatment. To keep it under control. And that's quite. That's how serious. It, this is why I find it annoying when sometimes. I. Listen to people talking about gluten free. And it's basically they're going. It's a, a lifestyle choice. It's not. For some people yes it is. And I have no idea why you would jump on it. Because 
honestly, and I, I this is speaking for me, and I hope my sister can't hear me, whenever I've tasted gluten-free food, it's tasted nowhere near like the same as the normal food has. Completely different, and I can't get my head around the flavour. But my sister, if she didn't have that, would literally, it gets very, very ill and can be hospitalised. My best friend, if she has it, incredibly ill. So it's a real thing. And it's quite worrying when you've got some people who have it. The red squirrel is number one enemy of the penguins in Madagascar. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, Hi, Paul Amos. <laughs> That's good. There are issues happening in this region. When I said about the early 800s, that generally means the region is Earth. Yeah, drink send. Just so much. So basically, Britain was sticking its tongue out and saying that France can't get, can't get me, and everyone was pretty sick of it. Um, to an extent. Let me see. Frigating mile. Yeah. Hi, Wayne's world of science and technology. Uh, Mr. Sart, hello. Glad to hear your new fluffy researcher sitting wanted to walk. That's true. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, the radiation students for Celex is, um, when it's really, really bad. It's the thing slightly beyond celiac. Take care, Ryan Cash. Right. Okay, before we get distracted by food completely, let's get into the strategic part. <laughs> Sorry. I should never start discussion of food when I'm hungry. I get completely distracted. It's terrible. This is the point to which one of my students would normally disappear off and grab me a Snickers bar. <laughs> I've got them well trained. Anyway. So, here is your strategic authorities for Russia and Sweden at this point. You have Gustav IV of Sweden, who is an imbecile. You have Alexander I of Russia, who is off his rocker. This one believes Napoleon is trustworthy. What is it with Russian dictators and believing people who are absolutely mm, are trustworthy? No idea. But anyway, Gustav IV of Sweden. Okay. How do I describe him in a word? Okay, a description. We're going to be talking in a bit about the British Expeditionary Force, which turns up the British send 10,000 troops to Sweden. He doesn't let them off the ships. He wants to use them to launch an offensive. Rather than fighting in Finland, he wants to go and attack Norway. And the British are basically going, there ain't enough troops. And... He spent his entire time through the war. This is one of the reasons why Russia wins this war, and I do argue Russia wins this war, is because he spends most of his time keeping his crack regiments back so he can launch an invasion of Norway at any time. Because he wants to conquer Norway. Because the Russians will be defeated in Finland, and once they're defeated there, then he'll use his crack troops to invade Norway. And, Derm Squad, I, I've seen your remark about Russian leaders, and honestly, you, th there isn't anything to pick from between these two. There is really not. In fact, there are some very good generals and admirals going around who 
could have done a lot better job. They are... They are personalities. Definitely personalities. Um, they are issue... They are very interesting personalities. Uh, let's be honest. Alexander the First... <laughs> He'd succeeded to his throne after his father was murdered. He would reign from 23rd of March, 1801 to 19th of November, 1825. And, well, this is an example. Um, he changed Russia's position towards France four times between 1804 and 1812. In 1805, he joined Britain in the World of Coalition against Napoleon. But he, of course, suffered defeats at Auschwitz and Friedland. So then he decides to form an alliance with Napoleon at the Treaty of Silt. Joining the continental system, fights a naval war against Britain between 1807 and 1812, a war against Sweden between 1808 and 1809, as we said, the Finnish War, because Sweden refused to join the continental system against their ally, Britain. And um, when the alliance collapsed of, with him between uh, 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 Napoleon over Poland, which collapsed in 1810, um, Alexander's described his greatest triumph was also depicted as when Napoleon's invasion of Russia was a catastrophe for the French. This is the part of the fact that Let's be honest, the Battle of Borodino. Is one of those things which can, from different perspectives, look awfully like a defeat for the Russians. The fact that they have a lot more troops and resources they can throw into it suggests that it's basically the same as saying, well, yes, we lost all these people, they're all dead. But you know what, we, we can replace them. Life is cheap. We don't care. Um, as part of the coalition... He gains territory in Finland and Poland. Um, in return, Sweden is compensated with land in Norway, I think, uh, and then forms the Holy Alliance to try and uh, suppress revolutionary movements in Europe, which he saw as a threat to Christian monarchs. Um, he is nuts. So... How do I describe Gustav IV of Sweden? He fervently believed Napoleon was the Antichrist on Earth. That is the opening and starting point. Gustav Adolf. Um, let's see. He secured an alliance with Britain on the 8th of February, 1808. And from that point onwards, he's even more. Hmm. To say he's stubborn is beyond belief. We'll get into the concept of operations shortly, but the concept of operations from the Swedish side are absolutely, and I say this with love in my heart, completely and utterly bonkers. So, I've flipped them around this time because I did had Russia and Sweden, now I've got Sweden and Russia. Okay, let's answer some questions. Stromak, so this is why the Swedish put Bernadette on the throne after the war. Mm -hmm. This is why Bernadette comes to, uh, gets control of uh, Sweden, yes. Oliel, the days of absolute monarchies really were wild. You have no idea. The amount of people who tell me, oh no, dictators are bad, I go, N I like a constitutional monarchy because it stops the politicians being able to get the top job and 
keeps us done just that little bit. It keeps there's just one person more in the room who's more important than the politicians when it comes to the public limelight, which I think is good for keeping control of the politicians' egos. <laughs> but I'm also don't want an absolute monarchy because honestly, I really like the ability to be able to pick and choose leaders and force them to keep remember and remember that the people they are sending off to war actually have a vote as to whether or not they're still in charge. Zappard, um, yeah, well, I think just because that's come up, um, Glyn has responded on that one that it's just him coming to dinner and it should be okay. As he's slightly less allergic than his wife. All right. Fifty feet. Liberation of Switzerland by Surf is still remembered with mixed feelings here. Yeah. I was asking. Nothing changed with Russian tactics since then. Uh, yes. Are the British the only sane people in the room? I, in nicest way, you cannot claim the British are the only sane people in the room. Okay, we will. Say that the British are plenty insane. We <laughs> can't help us. There is no one who's really saying it right. So, here is the concept of operations. For Sweden, the fence of Finland was based around an incomplete or badly maintained fort, so complete misunderstanding of the quality of infrastructure. The Swedish maps actually, it actually completely omit whole road systems which had been built, in some cases, with money from Swedish, the Swedish government, had actually invested in building roads, and hadn't added those roads they built onto their maps, or the upgrades to put on roads, or the, new, or the br upgrades to bridges. So they had no idea they'd actually built the infrastructure that Russians could use to invade them. They didn't realise it was there. They didn't realise the troops could move as easily as they could. Okay. As a result, the plan can be summed up as passively defend and hold on to the fortifications in the southern coast of Finland, in which Sweden had strong garrisons, while the rest of the Swedish army retreated to the north. In the spring, counterattacks simultaneously from north and south, when the Swedish army would have naval support and the Russians army would be spread over Finland and thus have long supply lines. Hmm. Modus operandi was avoid major decisive battles and fight a war and maneuver. Two small issues, have I just pointed out. Infrastructure, they didn't know existed for this plan. And the forts are incomplete and falling down. For example, Sverbog, uh, this very critical port for the control of uh, a key port and access point for their navy. Um, the fortifications which would defend it from land attack had not been completed. Now, before anyone starts gloating about this, Please remember, what was the exact thing that happened with uh, Singapore? Oh, yeah. Critical fort that was needed to necessary to, you know, for the operations and access. And uh, the land side fortifications that were dependent for attacking, a uh, land force attacking, had not been completed. Oh, God. History doesn't repeat, but it surely doth rhyme. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Russia. Let Russia. Let's be honest. Alexander the First. Um, uh, we're not getting into that again. Pretty much go to Sweden into war. Had massive information, including defectors from Finland, including a general. Uh, meaning their maps were actually more realistic and accurate than Sweden's by a country mile. The Russian plan, concept, attack in winter when the frozen waters negated the Swedish naval advantage. Yes, remember this point, Sweden had a far larger and far more capable navy than Russia did, especially in the Baltic. 
Phase 1. Advance and isolate fortifications, concentrating on taking the whole of southern Finland before advancing north. Phase 2. Cut off the retreat of the main body of the Swedish army. Phase 3. Annihilation. There is a small problem here. Both plans actually support each other. The problem is... Phase 1 for the Russians works if those forts fall. Phase 1 for the Sweden works if those forts su survive. So... The essential thing you'd think about, the essential critical thing here would be building up ammunition, stockpiles in those forts, and uh, making sure they were in good repair. Oh no, Gustav gets in the way. And by the way, here is the trick. Like with comic books, where you have, if you have an Italian character in a comic book, they will either be really good or really bad. They could be a hero, they could be a coward, they could be anything, whereas... When in those World War II comics, the Brits were one character, the Americans are pretty much one sort of style of character, the Germans are all another style, uh, you know, their style of character. You can pretty much know their character before they're going to get. Gustavs are either really good or really terrible. They are nothing in between. They are always an interesting, they are, they are always variety. You cannot really predict what they're going to be. Well, Gustav the Fourth is a bumbling, egocentric, absolutely cowardly twink. And please note, I'm using that as twink as a um, code for another word, which I cannot use. So, because it's a swear word. And I'm doing this publicly. And it's in teacher mode. We don't swear. So, he is absolutely sure that his forts will survive, but he doesn't send them any resources, doesn't send them any re uh, provisions, doesn't resupply them, doesn't check they're in good order, for fear of giving Alexander I pretext for going to war. So, and this is, makes this really surprising as this, okay? Russia concludes the treaty with, of Silt with Napoleon in 1807. Alexander sends his letter to Gustav in September 1807. All right? War doesn't start till February 1808. So in theory, in theory, let's say Gustav thinks about this a little bit. While he's going for time, and the 8th of February 1808, he actually has an alliance with Britain, agreed. He has, set, not, let's be honest, September's pretty much over. It's 21st of February, when he, uh, 24th of September when he received the details. So... Let's say he has October, November, December, January, and most of February. In fact, if you consider it's the 21st of February when war begins, and 24th of February, 24th of September when it's the letter of the seed, you can say five months. He has five months to get this fixed. He has five months. Even worse, he sends out his commander, Count Wilhelm Moritz Killingspor, um, to be field marshal in Finland. 
with a set of instructions which were more, uh, how do I put this, ideas for operation. And he isn't even there in Finland when Friedrich Wilhelm von Buxhoven, who's the Russian commander, leads 24,000 soldiers across the border in Arvoski and takes the town of Lovisa. So, Lieutenant General Karl Nathaniel Afklerke acts as Swedish commander in Finland. He didn't have an army assembled at this point. He therefore ordered the army to assemble at Tavistos. And waits for the arrival of King Killingsford, who was supposed to be the commander. Who managed to arrive on the 2nd of March. And he decides immediately he doesn't want to fight at Tavistos. He wants to war order the army, orders the army to withdraw. The Russians also managed to force the soldiers in Svavaks to withdraw. The king was so unprepared for the attack, and war wasn't officially declared, and that, you know, he mentally didn't really realise the attacks were taking place. War itself wasn't actually declared till April. Please note that. So, uh, the troops invade in February... The Russians didn't declare war till April. There were 21,000 Swedish troops stationed in the various fortresses in Finland. But there was also a large Swedish army sitting in southern Sweden with for fear of a Danish attack. Which was unlikely to happen because... Someone had already annihilated the Danish Navy, helpfully. Can't think who'd annihilated the Danish Navy. This is how it starts. The Swedish fortress at Svalholm, which was commanded by a major Karl Magnus Gretberg, was, uh, well, well, let's put it this way. To describe it as ill-prepared is to overestimate what ill-prepared means. He had a garrison of 700 troops, a third of whom had functioning weapons. The fortress's guns itself had no carriages, and it lacked adequate and food and ammunition stores. The wells were unusable. And, well, after starting the siege on 21st of February, the Russians demanded the surrender of the fort. It was refused. They demanded again on the 2nd of March. It was refused. The Russians do a bombardment in March. Grevenberg agrees to negotiations. And the fortress surrenders on the 18th of March after the siege had lasted a month with only one trooper having been wounded in action. Sverborg, I meant I'm going to be discussing in a second, um, had been, was supposed to be considered well prepared. Had a garrison of 6,000 troops and uh, 700 cannons, enough stores to last until the summer of 1808. Fortress lay. Uh, the Russians laid siege to the fortress, and it eventually surrendered in May 1808. This uh, This is where the Swedish lost the main body of the their archipelago fleet as well as the stores of supplies and munitions. So uh, that one's going to be covered. But yeah, this is how the war begins. At 5 a.m. in the morning, the Russians cross. The Swedes are worried about Norwegians and the Danish. 
But remember, the British do turn up with 10,000 troops. And this is some of the engagements. But let's answer some questions before we get into a lot of different things. Shamak, read the British Senate. The British take on so much debt, they change how we think about state finance because they refuse to acknowledge that they lost the war to the French. Yes, they were very Roman versus Carthaginian. Patrick Renan, did not the Swedes take out a census 100 years before and found out instead of having a million men, they only had 100,000? Um, it wasn't quite that bad, but yeah. They've had fun with some of their censuses. Now, the actual battles I'll be discussing at various points in this presentation and this discussion tonight. Um, well, of course, crossing the border in Finland. I already mentioned that one. But I'm going to do the Siege of Svelbog because, well, as you see, they, they lose quite a lot of their navy. Occupation of Gotland, because that's kind of interesting. The Battle of Lemo. Battle of Urus, Helsinki Village Landing, and the Convention of Aland. That is a rough timeline of things. It basically lasts February 1808 to September 1809. And does involve Gustav the Fourth losing his throne. Which at which point things start to look up very greatly for the Swedes. Napoleon in his prime was a fairly decent general. Was he the best general ever? No. Was he even the best general in the French army when he was in charge? No. He had a few others who were probably smarter and better and more able who served him. And that's the point. At a certain point, he has the right balance of political, mil uh, political power, military power, and the right national story and identity and level of celebrity to do what he wants to do. Which is useful. Doesn't mean he's great. But it is called the Napoleonic era rather than the Nelsonic era for a reason. Uh, Dobska, was this before or after King Charles of Sabaton fame? Oh, I cannot remember which King Charles they're talking about in that, vid and that song. Uh, right. So, the British send Gustav uh, General John Moore. Sir John Moore. With 10,000 troops. This is the force which actually ends up fighting the Peninsula War. So, they're not bad troops. He arrived on the 17th of May. He was not allowed to land his troops. War at Gothenburg on 17th May. He was summoned to Stockholm to confer with Gustavus. Who, well, in his words and in the description of Brian Murray Boy, um, crazily found crazily bent on schemes of conquest. The king proposed the British, with some Swedish troops, should seize Zealand, and afterward that the British should go to Finland to fight the Russians. More objected this force was insufficient for such projects on which Gustavus ordered him not to leave the capital. He made his uh, and basically tried to take the British general prisoner. So the British general had to escape to Gothenburg in the guise of a peasant and returned with the troops to England. Moore appeared to think that he had been sent on a wild goose chase for some party purpose and in a private letter referred to the service as the most painful in which he had been employed. 
Brits were already at war with Russia. They'd been at war with Russia since 1807. Brits are regularly at war with Russia throughout history. There is a the, the, for, that might explain why Russia has a weird fixation sometimes on Britain being the sort of the power behind the throne manipulating America. They alternate between us being America's puppets or America being our puppets. It's quite an interesting dichotomy because you can only be one or the other. You can't be both. Good luck with the Wi-Fi that suffered. So, that's 10,000 troops. Not a small force, if we consider the Russian invasion force 24,000 troops. So, the British turning up with 10,000. If they'd gone to Finland with some of the troops, let's say he'd go... Well, he has two options. He could use them. Uh, he could have parked them in... It could have parked them in southern Sweden, used them to replace 10,000 of his own troops, and sent those to reinforce the mobile army, army fighting in Finland. Or he could have asked them to go and support the mobile army fighting in Finland. More as objection was that he was supposed to go and see Zealand, which had a garrison, and was fairly well organised. And then also, then go and fight in Finland. He couldn't do both. If you wanted to go and reinforce Finland, he'd probably have done that. Stretching what his orders were, but he probably would have done that. But he can't, doesn't have the troops to do both. So the Brits turn up, and then Brits go away. Now, it's kind of interesting because what for, uh, they arrive on the 17th of May. So they arrive after Svelborg has fallen. And with all this going on around it. Svelborg is, of course, rather an interesting scenario as the sieges go. As sieges go, it's sort of interesting. In that, well, if you look at those fortifications, you're basically dealing with an island fortress, a series of island fortresses. But you can also see, if you look, there are lines where the fortifications don't look complete. The reason they don't look complete is they've fallen apart. And this is the main base and the main naval base for the Swedish Navy in Finland. And if you look where Sverborg is, if you look at the big map I've got on the right of the screen, you will see it is particularly well located for holding the Russian Navy back in St. Petersburg or watching their other Baltic forts and making sure the Russians have to keep their side of the Baltic. It's a critically important base. When Kronstadt decides to surrender and negotiate truce, they only had enough ammunition left for two weeks, and the men were getting sick. But he does, and this is a trouble, this is a commander, is Kronstadt, uh, is he refuses to torch the fleet. In just in case the fortress survived and there was no fleet left.
again, if we consider when the British turned up, the Swedes did know the British were on their way. If Swedish reinforcements had arrived before the 3rd of May, then the agreement with the Russian commander was that there would be no there would be no capitulation. But if they hadn't arrived by the, by 3rd of May, there would be an honourable honourable capitulation. The trouble is the uh, couriers uh, bearing requests for reinforcements were actually delayed by the Russians and so didn't reach Stockholm until the 3rd of May. Which was a clever trick by the Russians. As the winter was cold and the, uh, the Baltic Sea was partially frozen at times, unlikely a fleet could have reached them, but, you know. The forgeries had lost six men and 32 wounded, as well as a couple of broken roofs and windows as a result of Russian actions in the siege. The fortress had been completed first in 1791. Since then, and remember this is 1808, so the fortress by this point is 17 years old, Servog had received no extra financial support from the government. The military equipment was all in an unsatisfactory condition. Most of the supplies were bad quality and lack, uh, any supplies they had, they had were bad quality and they lacked uh, most of them. The cannons were old and most uh, um, a good chunk of them were obsolete. Their range was much shorter than that of the Russian artillery. And so they were unable to return foreign Russian troops to bombarding the fortress. Even worse, it had actually never been fully completed. The fortifications on the islands had been constructed, but none of the landside defences, including, uh, including the original plans by the Augustin Ensensvard, the architect, were actually constructed. The pro there are many, many problems with the Siege of Svobog. Basically, you put a commander who was in a bad situation and made it even worse, because he had 2,000 civilians in the sea, in, in the thing with him, in, in there with him. He is often pointed that he's of um, Finnish Swedish aristocracy, who, some of them, were working towards the um, secession of Finland to Russia because they felt that was inevitable, including some of his relatives. And also he did dislike the king. Eh. But honestly, this Gibraltar of the North was no Gibraltar, because in contrast, Gibraltar received regular upgrades and regular updates to its defences, had, had regular work on it. Uh, it's almost like the British were expecting it to be under siege, and in this case, this is supposed to be the linchpin. It's kind of Singapore scenario again. It's supposed to be the linchpin of your security. It's supposed to be the linchpin for you. Why are you not working on it? Hi, Yikas. Hello, Mr. Richards. Sounds like somebody embezzled the money. Sounds like no one actually applied the money. 
it's just it's just absurd and it gets worse it really does get worse and if you look at this map again you'll notice that the russians are just pushing away pushing away and the swedish their usual advantage is they control the sea there should be no movement in this bit there should be no movement there is the Russians are able to move because the sea's iced up, but also... Oh, bring it down. Now, not everything goes the Russians away. There is Gotland. Gotland is rather an interesting scenario. Um, the Russians <sighs> send an invasion force of nine merchant ships and land on the 22nd of April. After losing its course in fog, they land with eighteen hundred men and six gun uh, six artillery guns, under the command of Admiral Nikolai Andreevic Bodesko. This gentleman. Now, the thing is, at this point, Sweden doesn't have any territorial troops, not like today. And in many ways, the huge and very capable armed forces that you have in Sweden and Finland, etc., to this day, are legacies of the Napoleonic War era because of these sorts of wars. The county governor, who was a retired Marine officer, go Marines, um, Eric Afklint, decided to start organising an armed force, which was a peasant levy. They encountered the Russian Expeditionary Force at Klinth Church, and Klint judged, Af Klint judged the situation unfavourable and had to ended up deciding to surrender without a fight. Basically, he found he was facing 1,800 pretty well-trained troops, and he had a few hundred really not well-trained people. Um, it, basically, he'd had 24 hours or less to actually train them to do anything, and <coughs> they didn't have uniforms, many of them didn't have guns, this was not a good idea. No! Uh, no, this isn't going to work. They surrender on the 23rd of April, without documents, uh, at the Sandsk Inn in Sandra, which apparently there is still an inn there that you can go and see. Anyway, next day, uh, the Russian force marched into Visby and found quarters. Uh, Bodisko proclaims himself governor of Gotland. And uh, but here is the interesting thing: allows all the Swedish official officials to continue in their roles and remain, apart from Clint, the governor. Then the Swedish ships start to turn up, and the Swedish navy starts to appear. First, two ships of the line. The Tapahem and the Magdalene. Uh They ar arrived from Krakstona and blockaded the harbour of Sil uh, on the, from the 12th of May. Amazingly, if they'd been there on the 22nd of April, there would never have been any landing. Let's be honest, the Russians turned up in nine merchant ships. If there'd been a single, just a single ship of the line sitting in that harbour, those things would have been turned to matchsticks before they could have landed any troops. Or they'd have been forced to surrender. The thing is, the Swedes have the naval power, they're just not using it, because Gustav has been holding... He's not only not been supplying and repairing his forts in Finland, he's not been letting his navy go and do the job it's supposed to do of being, Hello! We're big, we're here. We'd like some beer. You can add. You can continue on the line. Uh, as a result, so Gotland is now block is then blockaded, and then a Swedish relief expedition is sent under Admiral Rudolf Sendersfrom. This gentleman. It's dispatched from Karlsruhe on the eleventh of May. He brings more ships to the line, in, uh, including King Gustav IV Adolf, King Gustav IV, uh, Vladislav, uh, Prince Frederick Adolf, and Aran, uh, plus the frigate Bologna. 
the Brigantines, Svala and Disa, and the yacht Fortuna. And he brought soldiers from Smaland, commanded by Lieutenant Colonel of the John Kulking Regiment, Carl Johann Fleetford. I do love the fact that most of these are Swedish uh, Swedish websites I've been using to get some of the names translated into English. I've got a couple of good books, but most of them I'm using Swedish language sites, good Swedish language history sites translated into English. So if I got things wrong, it's probably a translation and my pronunciation. Um, when it, the Russians heard that the Swedish forces were on Gotland, the Russians capitulated. So the Russian for uh, the Swedish force of two thousand, by the time it managed to march to Tulln and from Sandvik and Gamling, uh the Russians had already surrendered to the navy. The Russians evacuated Visby on the seventeenth of May, leaving Gotland via Silt the next day. Uh, yeah, the Swedes had one loss, who was boatsman Karl Friedrich Legum who fell to the death from the Konung Gustav IV Adolf. As a result of his loss, Burdisigo was court-martialed, loses commission, and later, later regains it. And, um, yeah. The occupation it leads to the organisation of national conscription, and the uh, Gotland National Construction was the first unit of, of its type formed in 1811. Took three years for them to get in the pro uh, into the process of it. That's an interesting thing. It's an interesting thing to look at what the reactions were. Which one? I'm here, back from taking photos of trains. Glad to hear it. How not to fight a war? Oh, we in the, uh, look. I'm trying to get through this by not saying a line, and then it got worse. Too often. But the point is, some of these battles are actually the highlights, because this is the thing, is if the Russians had had a decent navy, they would never have got that back. The, the Swedes wouldn't have got that back. You know, we then have the Battle of Lemo, which is a really freaking interesting time because two and a half thousand Swedish troops are landed in Kaina in southwest Finland. They are supported by the Swedish Navy. The Swedes were intending to liberate Abbo. Their troops were commanded by Major General Ebek von Gesser. The Russians only had 3,600 troops in the area. Here is the thing. If Gustav had actually been in any way at all approachingly decent in dealing with John Moore, or had freed up anywhere approaching the, some of the professional troops he had, there is no reason he should have lost that battle. Here is the makeup of the Swedish troops. They send one battalion of the Swedish and Finnish guards, the Sphere. 600 troops. The vast majority of the troops, 1,770 men, come from the Upland Landwehr Brigade. They have 75 cavalry. From the lifeguards or the horse. And they have 108 sharpshooters from Sverbog. Or riflemen. Plus 200 Finnish pe peasants. And 6 guns from the guards artillery. Now. That equates to 2,813 troops. If you'd had the British Expeditionary Force around, you could be talking about landing a force of 12,000 troops. In which case, the Russian force of 3,600 would have gone, Hello, 
What's happening here? The problem for the Swedes throughout this war is that Gustav not only wants to fight a defensive war and win on the defensive in Finland, which you can't do. Well, you could have done if you'd paid the reinforcers, but he wants to win on the defensive while using the cheap troops. He doesn't want to risk his well-trained, his core units. No, no, he's keeping them back for his invasions of Norway. There's often put of people going back, well, they're going to invade. Well, as to quote what John Moore seems to have been arguing is, the Danish don't have a navy anymore. The Royal Navy have annihilated it. Oh, and by the way, when his expeditionary force turns up, guess who brings John Moore's 10,000 troops? Anyone want to guess what turns up with it? Yeah, a Royal Navy squadron. Not a big one, but enough to make the point. And that is really what you're talking about. And that won't be the only time a Royal Navy squadron turns up. In fact, a Royal Navy squadron is pretty darn critical later on in the war. And then, the interesting thing is, the British send a squadron under the command of Admiral James Saurez, with 10 ships of the line and 17 smaller ships. He is a full Admiral the Red, he will end his career as. And he takes part in what's called the Baltic Campaign, when he's a Vice Admiral the Red. So, there's a lot going on. The battle demo itself is a rather interesting example in how not to fight a battle. It really is an example of how not to fight a battle. So, here it is. The moment they land, Major General von Vecchenek starts immediately to entrench his landing site. The main defence line was set along the train facing the open field. The guns deployed to the front of the Alalemo Ala Manor House. The gunboats that escorted the landing fleet were positioned at the strait so they could close the strait and had a view of the battlefield. The Russians deployed themselves along the, uh, uh, the Rakuvirberg main road. Um, initially, the Swedes managed to advance several kilometres and eventually have Turku in sight. However, When units of the Labau Infantry Regiment, which is the sort of one of the key formation for the Russians, with one of the artillery guns launched the, the first Russian counterattack, they managed to push the advanced Swedes back to their main defense line. Begasek then responded by attacking the Russian center. Russian commander Bagavar received reinforcements and attacked with divided forces, sending two companies to attack on the right, two companies on the left, and two companies with the gun in the center. At this point, Vegasek's son, Lieutenant von Vegasek, found the Russian leg flank open and attacked immediately. The Russians were forced to withdraw a few kilometers in defense, and the Swedish troops followed very quickly. At this point, Major General Bozidin managed to collect more reinforcements, and including a squadron from the Finland Dragoon Regiment, which 
is quite nice to get. The Finnish Dragoon Regiment are part of the Russian army, please note. In the early morning, the Liberal Infantry Regiment again managed to make the Swedish troops retreat towards the main defence line, and von Vegasai ordered all the men from the nearby islands to the Lemo, uh, Lemo battlefield and strengthen the defence line. Begu, uh, Begva received the uh, Musketeer Regiment as an additional reinforcement, and then launched a whole front attack with bayonets. The Pernov Regiment on the right, the Lebau Regiment in the centre, and the Breath Regiment on the left. The Russian artillery set fire to the Ala Lemo man Manor House, and the Swedes are forced to pull back and eventually evacuate to their ships. Fortifications at the shore and later the gunboats defended the, uh, the, defended the retreating Swedes. Russian artillery moved to the shore and fired on the Swedish fleet, at which point von Vegasak pulled back both land and sea forces to the Aland Islands. The whole thing deployed was 2,400, 2,600 troops plus 6 guns from the Swedes, 3,600 troops plus 8 guns from the Russians, and casualties and losses were between 200 and 20 to 300 killed and wounded, or killed, wounded, or captured on both sides. It's a messy, dirty little battle, but it's not containing a lot of troops. And this is the first thing you start to realise. This is something you have to think about when you're considering northern operations, and also when we're considering operations today. Wars which involve armies of hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands are rare. And even wars where there are armies of hundreds of thousands wandering around, i.e. Napoleonic Wars, World Wars, there are often also battles fought between a few thousand. And well-organized brigade-sized forces of ten of you know five to ten thousand, depending on how, can have a major impact on operations, especially if they're self-efficient and organized. They can be a major force enabler and a major force. If Swedish king was competent, he'd have won. Yeah, unfit to rule is an understatement. Yeah. Dangerous. I cannot find a letter about the Swedish expedition at the moment in the archive. If you can find a letter from John Moore basically going, I hate you all, to the, uh, the British government, yeah, that, that's a good letter. Royal Navy Baltic Squadron was, uh, yes, majoritively third rate. I think with a second rate as flagship was on the Samaras, and that's more than enough for dealing with anything in the Baltic. Let's be honest, is there anything, is there, after you've done Copenhagen twice, is there anything in the Baltic which is going to be a threat to a Royal Navy Squadron of third rates? Is there really? No. The Royal Navy knows they're not. So, the Battle of Ravis, which is... I picked because it's quite an important battle, in my mind. Um, there are issues in this battle. There are really... Uh, you have Karl Johan and Adolf, uh, Adolf, Adolf Kritz, who was in charge of the Swedish troops. And uh, Nikolai Milakovich Kamensky of um, the Russians. Interesting about Kamensky is I'm not sure if he's ha ever had a 
Anything named, any sort of ships named after him? Can't remember. He is also apparently the great, great, great grandfather of Helen Millen was his father. So they share a great, 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 great well, Helen Millen's great, 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 great grandfather was apparently his father. Which is an interesting one to hear about, but um, I'm not a hundred percent sure of that factoid. I found it. In, I found it referenced re referenced on Wikipedia, and I found it referenced in a couple of articles, but I haven't really found any much digging into it. He managed to live to these thirty-four years old, and crap packed a lot into that. Anyway. So, the Battle of Arras. Right then. It took place in Mondevora in Western Finland. And it's... Some regard it as a turning point. Honestly, I just regard it as one of the battles which blew up the whole Swedish idea of victory. It takes place in one of those places where, honestly... You sit there and go, why are you fighting a battle here? It looks like the worst place in the world to actually fight a battle. There's got to be a better way to a place to fight a battle than this one. Seriously. The Swedish forces at Vigna Water retreated to Ulu. Uh, they managed to repel the Russians and reach Savonia, despite this was the opposition of Sverbog. And Russia's re Russia managed to recuperate their strength rather quickly. So by the end of August, the Swedish army was again retreating northwards along the coastal road. To avoid being encircled, uh, Colonel uh, George Karl von Dubin was sent in advance to Nica uh, Nicaragua with a brigade. And Nicaragua with a brigade. The threat of encirclement was not as great as it was often believed. But the Swedish army was pretty much at this point panicking and collapsing. Again, it would be really useful to have had 10,000 allies in the field or somewhere known that they were fighting along, fighting with you and supporting you. Or being able to deploy 10,000 more troops from home to reinforce them. Because, let's be honest, the battle here is going to be 5,000 versus 6,000. That's the battle. So if you had deployed ten thousand, another five thousand troops, you've got even. St you've got an a ten to six advantage. You uh, you deployed seven thousand. Well, you've got seven thousand fresh troops from home. Yeah, seven thousand troops from uh, uh, from home garrisons, well trained troops. Added to the 5,000 got there, that's 12 to 6. Got 2 to 1 in superiority in numbers. That would be a nice, that could well be a nice victory. You've got decent generals. Deploy all 10,000. Well, you've got, then would have 15,000 to 6,000. Well, that's kind of nice. That's a 5 to 2 advantage in, in numbers. Imagine that. Russian steamroller goes up. We've got 6,000 troops. Oh, sugar, you've got 15,000. We'll better withdraw then. And that changes the cycles, because suddenly the 5,000 troops you've got with you've been just withdrawing are suddenly going, Ah, eh, look at us now. You're now having to run from us. Look, we've turned, we've got these guys with us. Or even better. Take the 10,000 from Britain as a commitment. Send 5,000 to own with them. Send 15,000 join them. You've got 20,000. This sounds like I'm talking random numbers. I'm not. This is basic... Logistics and strategy. You need numbers to win. You cannot even win a defensive war if you are outnumbered all the time. If you're going to stop your enemy being able to succeed the sieges and be able to relieve places, you need to have an army in the field, which can match in enough that the enemy is not confident of winning. 
The Russians deploy an army of 24,000. That's disappeared by this point. Yes, they've made up numbers, but they've got troops in garrisons. They've got troops going in different operations all over the place. They've only got really a field army of six to 12,000. So if you had got that expeditionary force from Britain, or just were using your own troops from home, you would have a very successful force going on. Yes, you would be weak, and you'd be more worried about maybe an invasion from Norway. I don't think invasion from Denmark is going to happen. But in which case, you use the time you've got before that actually happens to raise up local levies and start training those troops up. There are options. Start doing them. Anyway. On the 30th of September, the Swedish army left Paravas and halted to await news from von Dobon, who was fighting the Russians at Jutlus. He, as I said, mentioned earlier, he'd gone at the same advance with a brigade to prevent encirclement. They heard cannon, and so they sent a brigade to reinforce von Dobon. The Russian main army advanced from Vasa in, in pursuit of the Swedish forces, and on the 4th of September was sent into bivouacs along the road between Vora and Arras. And Major General Major Yalkov Kulnov's troops took the lead and were the first to make contact with the Swedes the next day. So, the battle begins, as so many battles do in this era, at dawn. When Kulnev's troops and a Swedish outpost by a bridge exchange shots. The Swedish position was reinforced continuously while Kulnev brought up the remainder of the troops. Fighting continues with heavy loss on both sides over this bridge until eventually the Swedes decide the position is untenable and they retreat to their own defensive positions at 10 a.m. So Basically, the fight begins roughly 6, 7 a.m. And they are held at this position for four hours. That should be more than enough time for you to dig in and pre have prepared fighting positions in your defensive line for your troops to fall back on. If the Swedish are at all organized. And this is another advantage for Gustav in having sent out, if he's got the British Expeditionary Force to go and go and help out. Because then he'd have had Major General Moore with them. And if let's say he cannot rely on all his generals 100%, may, may, maybe they are psyched out because they are, Finland has been occupied so many times and they are worried about the Russian, mighty Russian steamroller taking over Finland and they don't want, they're not sure what's going to happen. Well, if they've got a British general with them, he's going to be organizing his troops and he's going to be watching them. And if they're not performing, hmm. And there will be people who want to fight still in that army. And they'll start motivating off each other. You could even put the British general in charge of the mobile army. The Swedish position was deployed along a ridge, which was protected to the north by an inlet. Which looks quite nice. And the Fajasa stream in the south. To north, south to north flow provided added defensive potential. That's what you sort of the river you have going through the middle. There was also a forest in front of the ridge, which had been cleared to afford the artillery a better view among of the arriving Russians. And the wood was supposed to be used to help provide stronger uh, strength in defense positions. Artillery bombardment began between the two forces and continued for an hour. Then the Russians mounted a frontal assault on the Swedish positions. Kulnev, on the Russian left wing, struck the Swedish right, was repelled, and forces became bogged down in the Fajr stream. Uh, the Russians then reinforced their right wing, with Nikolai Dimitrov getting the reinforcements he needs, and makes another assault. It's also repelled. But for some reason at this point, discipline breaks down, and the Swedish decide to leave their positions and counterattack. This was, despite Adlerkrutz, the 
the Swedish commander, issuing no orders to that effect. The Swedish counterattack was, unsurprisingly, overpowered by fire and forced to withdraw with incredibly heavy losses. At this point, the Russians make a second attempt to turn the Swedish left flank, which thinned out the Russian centre. And so Alder Cruz at this point does order a forceful attack to try and exploit that weakness. The attack proceeded swiftly, the whole Swedish line is carried along, and the entire Russian line is forced to retire back into the forest where the battle had begun early in the morning. At this point, unfortunately, Alder Cruz is pretty much out of ammunition. And as Russian reinforcements arrive, the spent Swedish army is forced to retire to their defence positions again. And then General Kamensky orders Demidov's right wing to make another attack on the Swedish left wing. And this takes place at night. The battle raged on for, uh, has already gone on for about 14 hours by this point, and at which point the Swedish army withdraws. So basically, it's low on ammunition, low on troops, low on morale. They still manage to almost win the battle until at the end, the Russians who are bringing up more just keep on coming. Yeah, I don't know. That's good. You're forgetting, your argument is sound, but you're forgetting Gustav the Fourth thing. Is it, oh, I think it's the Gustav the Fourth. Oh, let me just check. I'm fairly sure it's Gustav the Fourth, isn't it? Or have I been called, is it Gustav the Sixth? No, it is Gustav the Fourth. It's Gustav the Fourth. I am right. People keep, keep trying to confuse me. It's Gustav IV, not VI. Gustav VI is a different issue from memory. <laughs> a de very different issue. <laughs> Good luck, Zephyr. This good. If General Moore had two thirds of his troops available, wouldn't he be the facto commander overall? Yeah. Pretty much, if General Moore was there with 10,000 troops, he'd have been in charge. Because it'd be in case of, yes, I am the Swedish commander. Good. And you have how many troops? 5,000. Good. I have 10,000, so you're one of my brigades. Carry on. We are two brigades. Okay, you're a division then. I don't mind. I have riflemen, I have cavalry, I have artillery, and I have a logistics train. We love you. We will follow you. General Moore, would you like to be our new king? Give me, let me organize the battle, then we'll work out whether I want to go for kingly duties. It's honestly, it, 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 this is the thing. This is the fort take place in the 14th of September. Um, if we go back, if you think about it, they lie, ar arrive in the 7th of May. So they can't do much for Sverbog. That's already fallen. Operation Gotland. You don't need the Royal Navy for that one. Although their ships turning up would have been kind of interesting. But that could have dealt with the Battle of Limo. And if we consider where that's happening. That would have been an interesting factor for the Battle of Limo. And if you de and then there's the Battle of Aravis in September, and then of course there's Helsinki Village. Now you probably wouldn't have had the British around for this, but again, if you have the British troops around and if you're winning, because was uh, it's um you know, it would have been different probably. 
Guys, was, was this a Persian patron or did Alexander the Clark decide to be tropical? Here's the thing. When I made a rough schedule back in December last year for this year's cruiser, the, the year of the cruiser, I also worked out some of the lives I wanted to do. And the Finnish War was one of the ones I stuck in. There have been so many interesting videos which I have stuck in just because I felt like it, which have turned out to be randomly topical this year. So, I better be careful in December next year of what topics I pick out for uh, December this year, what I pick out for 2023, haven't I? Because at the moment I'm being disturbingly topical. That's good. Also, General Moore Councils always says, I'm taking my troops and going home, which probably causes the most Swedish army to follow him regardless of orders. Well, he only does that when he's dealing with Gust when Gustav IV tries to kidnap him. So, Helsinki Village. Helsinki Village is... Um, how do I put this? Right. So, Gustav planned a large landing operation. The idea was to send over 8,000 troops. However, what actually arrived was 3,500 soldiers who were well damaged and broken. Task force mainly had to return to Sweden damaged and broken. The 3,500 men under Lieutenant Colonel Gustav Olfring Olaf Landreg landed at the village successfully and they tried to advance the inland areas. Gustav actually arrived on the 20th of September in 18, 1808 on his own yacht in the, at the battle. He actually came to the battle himself. I'm not sure if he was planning to be in charge of the battle, but he turns up him actual self. So... Their landing starts at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, they push back the Cossacks who are patrolling the area. Swedish troops advance slowly, and the Russians react as quickly as they can, sending three companies from the Penov Musketeer Regiment, supported by two cannon, to oppose the advancing Swedes at Jampera. Kronberg Regiment um, offensive caused the Russians to retreat, and so the Swedes had lost four, had just four wounded men wounded on the first day of fighting. 27th of September, well, the Swedes again proceed to advance in the direction of the village of Vainen. There, there is a Russian lieutenant general waiting. Uh, Karl Gustav von Bugvo builds a defensive line with a battalion of the Nevesky Musketeer Regiment. And their job was to delay the progress of Swedes, but the Swedes managed to push the Russians back to their positions. At this point, Gustav Reinhard von Afgenes is named commander of the Swedish battle forces. And the Swedes lost 12 killed, 71 wounded, and 13 three missing on the second day of fighting. And then on the night on the 28th of September, Prince Beto Bagathreshen brings sizable reinforcements to Bagvu. So uh, the Russians are reinforced. Bourge, that's the Swedish commander, planned a two-pronged offensive for the Swedes, and one force attacking from North Villain to Pusta, while at the same time uh, the leg of Ring force would strike the flank of the Russian force at Pusta through a Hanaronim Panther. Basically, the idea was to split up his forces, which is always sensible to do when your enemy's got reinforcements. Instead, Bajavu takes the initiative and manages to strike directly to Bodge's mainline position, Simultaneously starting a flank offensive via Rantha. At which point, Lagerbring's attack is stopped by the force of the Russian troops and he has to retreat. Boje found the situation hopeless and orders a general retreat onto Helsinki village. At the beach, the situation is chaotic to say the least. The king orders all the gunboats to Kaluhu 
and so they were uh, had because he felt like moving them there, which meant there were only troop ships left. So instead of them being able to retreat back on their gunboats to provide fire support and defend them while the Russians were attacking, the ships were having they were having to load on troop ships while the Russians were firing. And this, of course, results in large losses. The Swedes sustained 45 killed, 106 wounded, and roughly 300 captured on the third day of fighting. The Russians lost 529 personnel for the entire three days. So, this was also quite annoying because this is a supposedly a deployment of some fairly critical troops, because this is the Swedish Guard Regiment, Finnish Guard Regiment, Sphere Lifeguards, the Jaegers, the Kronenberg, a light infantry regiment, um, the lifeguards horse, which had two squadrons deployed, and the uh, sphere artillery regiment. So they are critical, they are fairly decent troops, and they have completely been knocked about because Gustav turned up and had a bright idea. Oh. That's God, you're telling me that the Orphan King is on a boat and no one decides he should have an accident full of a boat on this night? No. <laughs> What's this the special need? No, that's an insult to people who, spe who, who have actual special needs. Yeah, sure. I don't remember. Is there a session of on the project one was exhaust like most? Oh, speaking of topical, yeah, actually there is. If you look through, um, if we go back quickly to this, if you have a look, you will see there are actually some Russian cruisers put in there. If you um, consider the Svaldov class is there, the Shafiev class is there, and there is the Kirov class there, and the Kirov are going to be done with the Moskvas. New Orleans are also going to include uh, Wichita. Or might not. I'm not sure where I'm going to put Wichita in because there's a point of which if do I do Wichita before I do the Brooklyn class or do I do it? There's a debate on that one. Right. Bum, 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 bum. We were at the Helsinki village one. So if anyone is feeling murderous towards Gustav the Fourth, you are perfectly entitled to frankly there is a lot of issues and that's what i agree next year is not going to be the year of the wmd so you might have noticed something the fighting by march 19, 1809 appears to have moved from finland to Sweden. This is how well the Finnish war is going. They are no longer fighting in Finland, they are fighting in Sweden. <coughs> no, Tyrion, don't say it's worse than anything the British could pull off. There are a few, uh, uh, there are a few sort of history, uh, there are a few campaigns that seriously we could talk about on that one. Um, in fact, honestly, there are many. But, okay. Hmm. So let's get, we'll just quickly talk about Gustav the Fourth. Right, so, on the 7th of March, 1809, Lieutenant Colonel George Adelsphere, commander of a um, the Western Army, Station of Armand, 
triggered the coup of 1809 by raising the flag of rebellion in Karlstad and marching upon, starting a march upon Stockholm. So this is while there is actually theoretically an offensive going on. They prevented the king from joining loyal troops, because apparently Gustav still managed to have some loyal troops in Scania. On the 13th of March, uh, seven conspirators led by Karl Johan Albertritz, remember him from earlier, broke into the royal apartments in the palace, seized the king, and imprisoned him and his family in the Grisholm castle. At which point Duke Charles, the king's uncle, was persuaded to accept the leadership of a provisional government, which was proclaimed the same day. Parliament, be it, was summoned to approve the revolution. Gustav tried to abdicate to save the crown for his son. But, 10th of May, 89, the Reichstag of the Estates, which was dominated by army officers, declared that not merely Gustav, but his whole family had forfeited the throne. Mm, there are many, perhaps, reasons for this. There were even some rumours of illegitimacy of children. Um, but probably the most likely reason is that the revolutionaries feared that if Gustav's son inherited the throne, he would avenge his father's deposi deposition when he came of age. Rather sensible. At which point, Charles is proclaimed Charles the Thirteenth under a new liberal constitution. And Gustav and his family are transported to Germany, where in 1812 he divorces his wife. He settles at St. Gallen in Switzerland, and lives in a small hotel in great loneliness and ignorance, a name of Colonel Gustafsson, for most of his life, or for remainder his life, and eventually suffers a stroke there and dies. He's buried in Morovia. Eventually, eh, later on, King Oscar II of Sweden suggests he gets his body brought to Sweden and interned in the Rederholm Church. But, um, yeah. So, that's going on in the background whilst... There's an offensive going on because, again, always sensible to be doing this while there's an offensive going on, let's be honest. So, basically, the Allende Offensive, and eventually the Convention, is a threefold attack on Sweden by the Russian Empire with the aim of enforcing peace. Sweden must enter the continental system, also surrender to Finland. Their plan was to attack Aland and then use that for an attack on Stockholm. Uh, George Karl von Doben, the commander of the Swedish forces, quickly withdraws most of his troops over the ice towards Stockholm, leaving Gotland, uh, Gotthard Johan von Kering and his Russian army in full control over the islands. If you look at the what we're talking about, we're talking about the islands which you can see the line straight from Finland to Stockholm. There is ice. It's iced up. The Russian, the first Russian columns have started moving on 10th of March. They reached Kumling three days later. Their first encounter ne occupied next day with Swedish Alpha of Vardo. And then they keep coming down. So the Russians are coming down the coast and the Russians are also trying to get across the Baltic. Here is another thing. 
The Swedish army, which is being pushed back from the Russians, is 6,000 strong. The Russian force coming for them is 17,000. Again, those 10,000 British troops would have been really useful. Okay? First rule of war. If, you've got, if your allies are offering you 10,000 troops, work with them. You know, at several points in this campaign, things could be changed by those troops being present. And also, here is the thing. If we consider the Peninsula War and what the British end up sending down there, the British would have mobilised more troops. Yes, they didn't put any, need to put another expeditionary army together to go to the Peninsula Campaign, but they'd have probably done that as well. Because the British were prepared to pay any price necessary to win and keep their allies fighting. Maintaining Portugal would have been as uh, maintaining Sweden would have been just as important to Britain as maintaining Portugal, and they could have afforded it. Now. Despite the Russian of uh, the Swedes being near annihilation. The Russian army uh, stops its offensive towards Stockholm. They were unable to enforce the peace. They stayed on the Aland Islands, and only a small cavalry division under Kulnev went ahead uh, went after the Swedes as a demonstration. They opened up negotiations, and von Dolben expressed the Swedish strive for peace, asking von Koning not to, uh, Korn, uh, von Noring, the Russian commander to not to disrupt the ongoing discussions of renewed attacks. So to cut on 21st of March, the Convention of Milan designed, which under the circumstances, well, let's put it this way, it's rather favourable to the Swedes. And resulted in an end of the offensive against the wishes of Alexander I, who rather was wanting to conquer the whole of fin uh, Sweden as well as the whole of Sw uh, Finland. He wanted it all. That's what Alexander I wanted. And trust me, he wouldn't have stopped with Finland. And this is the interesting point. At this point, why are the... You are, might ask yourself, why are the Norwegians and the Danish... The Danish Norwegians not invading, not using this time to attack? Because they're also smart enough to realise that, okay, A, they have no navy. B, the Royal Navy has shown up at this point. They have. Uh this point, we are talking the Royal Navy does show up quite heavily. Um, as mentioned earlier, in uh, they turn up in May 1809. It's when the Royal Navy turns up with under Admiral James Summers. <whistles> Remember, 10 ships of the line, 17 smaller ships, mostly frigates and brigs. That's not exactly a nice force to have turn up in the Baltic. And it's pretty darn effective. And that's what's coming after this. So, yeah, getting the convention signed is sensible. Vision. So when the Baltic freezes, you can move armies across water like games of risk. Hmm. Do you want the campaign video win? Hmm. Who knows? Sonic Nero, are there any unfinished naval fortifications nowadays? Hmm. <laughs> well, you could argue countries don't have them, because let's be honest, how many countries actually have land based anti ship missiles they can move around? Even countries which sensibly should have them. Let's be honest, if there's some, you know. We're talking about the U.S. Marine Corps buying those sort of things. They can move around to islands. Well, if you're thinking about whenever... Uh, this is one of the things I find interesting whenever you're talking about the British Army. Uh, they go, uh, they're they always talking and trying to justify themselves. And you're going, well, okay, so the defense of the U.K. Well, mainly we can sit out an Air Force thing, although they don't have many sh aircraft that can actually launch anti-ship missiles, if any. Um, if we have any anti-ship missiles, which we don't currently have many of. So, yeah, it's basically the aircraft... Uh, the, the army doesn't have, uh, doesn't have any 
area air defense missile systems. They only have a few point defense missile systems, scepter base, land scepter and sea scepter are the systems Britain has. Um, nothing equivalent to a Patriot or Thad. They have no anti-ship missiles, land-based or sea air-based. So yeah, Britain has problems. Um, naval fortifications are not obsolete. They just changed. Now you would think of fortifications as a building a fort. Think of it these days more as having equipment you can have wandering around. Think of how Ukraine has defended their coast. Mines, missiles, sea denial tools. That's how you do defence these days with wide area sea denial. And so then you sort of go, okay, well, what's it, it's my first thing is I support the army, I support the British Armed Forces, I think they should be stronger than they are. But you have to have a policy of what are they going to do? How are they going to do that? And how will they get to where they need to do that? That's what you need to ask. And uh, many questions I often find surprising whenever I hear the army, especially when they're being rude about the aircraft carriers or even the amphibious ships, I sit there and go, you guys are insane. If you don't have the carriers and you don't have the amphibious ships, why are we going to have an, an army? Because the army can't get anywhere without those things. Without the carriers to protect the convoy, uh, pro provide the area air defense, and the amphibious ships to provide the initial forces to land the uh, to take up uh, the area. Then how how are you guys going to get there? Do you all are you always believing that we're going to be fighting from allied ports that we can get to? Because let's be honest, that's worked well with no country ever. Basically, Saudi Arabia first Gulf War gives everyone this false idea that we're always going to be able to get our forces where we want when we want them, and they forget the huge, absolutely overwhelming. Na amount of naval firepower deployed to make that possible. The sheer number of aircraft carriers, fleets, the, for the leftover for that were still hanging around in the immediacy of the post Cold War era that were deployed to make that viable. It's absolutely obscene the amount of force which is deployed, which is why Iraq does nothing about the buildup of forces in Saudi Arabia. They don't want to risk it. No one does. No one's that insane, the sheer amount of force. But it gets completely forgotten. Literally, don't need a ground-based turret with an 18-inch gun if you have a bunch of trucks with surface-to-surface -surface missiles running around. Yeah. But you need to actually have those trucks and those missiles, and probably drones to provide them with targeting information. Right then. So... Hello, Grand Duke. Though, Scott, you'd almost think they swallowed the War of Choice Doctrine, big submarine hook, line, and sinker. Ah, don't get me started on the War of Choice Doctrine. That's a rant which can have to take place for an entire hour. Uh... So, the Battle of Rattan, and... It's one of the more uh, one of the sort of more interesting battles, I think. It's a Swedish victory. It's the last battle fought on Swedish soil during the Russo Swedish War. It takes place a day apart from the Battle of Savar. So, having conquered Finland, the Russians had sent a small force into northern areas of Sweden, as I basically showed this map earlier. And well. The Russians moved along the coast road. They defeated a Swedish land force um, 
the Swedish land force at Rattan, uh, uh, Swedish forces landed at Rattan at Savar on the 19th of August. However, the Swedes then pulled back to their navy uh, to their ports to try and evacuate because the Swedes were trying to use the sea as their inter interior logistics and sort of moving out that way an area of maneuver. At which point, the Russians decide to attack the troops withdrawing. And what I find really annoying about this is, technically, at this point, Gustav Wachtmeister, the Swedish commander, has 5,400 troops. Nikolai Kamensky has 3,000. The Swedish task force that's supporting him has two ships at a line, a frigate, 44 of those little gun sloops you can see, six galleys, between 20 to 40 tra uh, troop transports. So that's a pretty hefty force. The Chen General Gustav Weichmeister was had been battle proven in the Prussian army, served in the Russo Swedish War of 1789 to 1790, and in the Pomeranian War. They decided to give him command over von Durban, who'd been fighting the Russians up to this point. The fact is, at this point, there is a combined Royal Navy and Swedish Navy, or the Orgsflotten, um, were holding the Russians at bay. So, pretty much, there is no Russian naval force that's going to threaten them. So, they leave Stockholm on the 8th of August. They sail north towards Rattan. Um, they stay, uh, they, they keep as far out to sea as possible. Arrive at Rattan on 16th of August. And they plan to land these troops and attack. They, they bark at 17th of August. They destroy a small detachment of Russian troops at the Dramonka. And then the Russian commander, Kamansky, learns of the Swedish task force, quickly wheels round and marches north. His plan is to fight Vakmaster's forces before Red arrives, um, another commander who's marching up. The Russians took position of the high ground. And so the Swedes decide to counterattack uphill. Now here is the point. The Royal Navy, as we know, there is Samaraz has arrived with all that force, 10 ships of the line, 17 other ships. But because of the way Gustav had treated John Moore and the British Expeditionary Force, there's no British troops. There's not a large um, uh, force of British soldiery sent. The British, again, could have provided more troops. So you have 5,000 attacking 3,000 uphill. Now, yes, you could say, oh, that's almost two to one, but it's uphill. And these Swedish forces have been pushed around quite a lot. Again, imagine if there'd been even a British force of 5,000 troops with the Swedish force. it had been 10,000 to 3,000, at which point you would probably have got a holding action and two flanking forces going, hello, you're in the middle. The Battle of Saval was basically a Russian victory, and the Russian army was too, fa uh, too damaged to face Red advancing from the south, so they were, can, uh, sort of tried to withdraw. The Swedes fall back on the Battle of the Village of Rattan, and they immediately sort of immediately start to prepare for another battle. Kaminsky decides to attack the Swedes. In a, his reason being a fight a delaying battle, so he can start withdraw the Russian forces because he knows that at some point he's going to have the other uh, Swedish army coming up and the all the troops which are there. Now, the thing is, the Swedes in the previous battle, Savar, had decided to leave, had not really had their artillery with them. 
And this point, in this battle, they have their artillery. They also have all the guns as illustrated in this lovely, lovely painting of their own, of the Navy. The artillery barrage actually destroys large parts of the village and the countryside around it. Unsurprisingly, Vachtmaster manages to hold off Kamensky, and afterwards he's forced to retreat northwards towards Batia. It's considered a, sp a Pyrrhic victory, but it does set, uh, set the grounds for the next battle. And next battle is disturbing. It's fun. That's called the ice tended to be several feet thick at that point of the uh, history. It they tend to be quite big, uh, quite thick. That's good. I imagine that the Royal Navy look at the astute class of the Prime Defence for Defensive Force for the UK. Trouble is the Royal Navy doesn't have that many astutes. So if you're going to have them up in the north, in the high north, doing intelligence gathering and operations up there, and possibly one in the South Atlantic and one in the Far East, uh, the odds are you don't have that many around. This is the problem. Yes, you know, when this policy was set out and the army didn't have those air defense missiles and the they didn't have anti-ship missiles, the Royal Navy had a whole fleet of SSKs as well as SSNs both in double-digit numbers. And the Air Force had double-digit numbers of air defense fighters, or air defense fighter squadrons. We don't live in that world anymore. We don't have that. So, that's the trouble. I think it was in Warship 2021 that they had a detailed breakdown of one of the French offshore defence turrets. Fascinating article. Yeah, it did. There's what I was getting. The American C-141 Starlifters got worked to death during Gulf 1. So much so that if another similar conflict broke out, the US would be on, with only one third of the air transport capabilities. Yeah. Grand Duke of Mecklenburg's Fenian. Tsar Alexander nearly started a war with Prussia and Austria during the Congress of Vienna. I don't remember who calmed Alexander down, but it was definitely he was definitely in something. Uh, he had a stand-up row with the British diplomat at the time, and the British diplomat absolutely gave him a full dressing down. The British could. Suramak, more or less disturbing than asking your ally to attack a target in another ocean and then trying to kidnap them when they don't agree. There are so many issues with Gustav IV. There are so many. Yeah, the Long Patrol's habit will be one to watch. It will also be one of a lot of me being quite rude about wars of choice and how you actually prepare your defensive forces. I know, because it's being recorded tomorrow morning. Ah, oh, so. The Battle of Patea. Okay, so the Battle of Patea is... Ah... Uh, well, being re-recorded tomorrow morning. I already recorded a version and don't like it, so it's being recorded. So. There's a Swedish naval squadron in the Baltic, and this is August 1809. Which is capturing Russian vessels when they found which they found sailing northwards. They found an infantry battalion stationed on the island of Patea. 
accompanied by some Cossacks, all under the command of General Nikolai Kamensky. Upon seeing the Swedes, a Russian soldier was ordered to ride on his horse to spread news to the, uh, uh, of their attack arrival. He was killed by fire from one of the Swedish sloops. The bridge that the Swedes were meant to destroy was clearly visible from the water, and it was determined that it could be destroyed easily by a, caron a caronade from the sloops. However, oh, I love it when you have these kinds of officers in the uh, armed forces. Major Hauswolf decided it was more appropriate to destroy the bridge personally. Uh, so instead of just firing artillery at it till it disintegrates, you're going to what? I'm going to row on a launch in the direction of the bridge. And I'm going to destroy the bridge personally. Because I'm a twonka. Or I'm more brave than sense. Surprisingly, he came under fire from Russian pickets. I do love the, the, the way this we just put it. Predictably. Surprisingly. Yeah, the Russian pickets see an idiot rowing his launch across the... And he was badly injured. At which point, command falls to George Samuel von Gedenfeld. Gedenfeld. Who decided that what he would do is take the Swedish ships into the narrow strait towards the bridge. At which point, they're beset on both sides by Russian infantrymen. Because they're now in range of the muskets. At which point, the Swedes try to reach the bridge. Using an advanced guard of some of the sloops and, you know, launches to try and get to the bridges. Again, you can destroy the bridges by firing your cannon. Stay back, fire cannon, destroy bridge, go home. That is the lead. That is all you need to do to win this operation is sit offshore and bombard. You do not need to go charging in like some forlorn hope. You are not at a siege. which point they realize that the Russians have the high ground. This is a naval operation. The high ground should not be featuring in this kind of thing. It, it, this is not the stone frigate scenario. This is, you are supposed to sit off the coast, bombard. They don't have artillery. Don't get in musket range. Don't try sailing into narrows. Just fire your cannon. So they decide to retreat because the Russians have the high ground. At which point the Swedes determined that a landing would likely not be possible given the strong position of Russian forces, but decided they would still try it. Then comes the moment of decision. They see 13 Russian transport vessels and then 10 tons of supplying, resupplying the Russian land forces. So two of the sloops set out to initiate attack on these ships. Those two vessels are forced to retreat back to Jamara, uh, to um, Jararis, because they see the transport ships are actually being escorted by cannon boats. And so the Swedish squadron at this point retire southwards. So they've lost six killed, 19 injured on their side. The Russians have had 13 killed, 20 wounded, seven captured. And they haven't destroyed a bridge. I know we've all been blaming Gustav the Fourth, but I think there is plenty of blame to go around in the entire Swedish military structure. There are some good gutter generals trying their best, and there are some good nobles and good people trying their best. But there is also quite a hefty dose of... What's the word I'm thinking of? Moron. I know, I'm not supposed to... I'm not swearing. I, I, moron is not a swear word. But it is appropriate going on here. Please note, and this is for all of you who might be watching this, who might someday, if there's some of you are watching this, who might someday end up in charge of forces, whether they be digital or real human ones. If you have the option 
of blowing up your target with no risk to your own forces, always take that option. Do not needlessly put your troops in danger, or even more sillily, put yourself in danger, for no reason when you don't have to. War is about managing risk. Some reward is worth a great deal of risk. However, if you can achieve a reward with no risk, you do it, because that conserves forces for when you do need to take a risk. We have all these guns. Why use them when we can row straight into the Russians, then sail into them? Yeah. Yes. So anyway, this is like if at D-Day the battleships would send out commander groups to destroy the Atlantic Wall instead of firing the guns. Yeah. Yeah, there is probably possibly a Russian admiral saying it's over, I have the high ground. I, I could have done an entire Star Wars meme and I've completely missed it. But that's because this just annoys me so much. Although appropriately... Oh no, this time, this, this is the reverse. This is Anakin standing up there shouting to Obi-Wan Kenobi, It's over, Obi! I have the high, high, I have the high ground! And Obi-Wan Kenobi going... Um, Anakin, yeah, you're on a planet. I'm in the Star Destroyer. Bye bye. So, for some reason, this war ends in a treaty. I can't think why. Now, I would like to say that the treaty of Friedrichstrom was fair and kind, but no, this is what happens to uh, Sweden afterwards. You can see there's sort of quite a large part of it becomes Finland and various other things. So, treaty. Sweden cedes parts of the provinces of Lapland and Vastabotten. Aland, uh, east of uh, that's Vastabodden, east of the Tonia River and Muna River, Aland, and all province is east thereof. Cedar ter uh, territories claims to constitute the Grand Duchy of Finland, to which the also the Russians added their 18th century conquest of Karelia and small parts of Nerland and Savonia. And as Viborg County, and together with the Diet of Piovo and the Oath of Sovereign, hmm? well, that's weird. That's not, I'm not sure on this. Uh, and basically, this treaty sets up the autonomous Grand Duchy. So that set up thanks to the Diet of Piovo, which was in 1809, the Oath of the Sovereign, and the, you know, this treaty. Uh, also set up its own administration and institutions, and that leads to the revival of Finnish culture, equal position of Finnish language, and ultimately in 1917, Finland's independence. So Finland becomes a duchy, uh, a grand duchy, and eventually gets independence in 1917, which is 108 years later. Emperor Alexander promised to retain old laws and privileges in Finland, but the treaty oversteps any formal guarantees of the legal position of Finland's inhabitants. It ignores it. Uh, for example, the Russians refused, and Swedes were not in a position to insist on these being retained. Um, when 90 years later the Russians tried a policy of Russification of Finland, 
the Russian government would argue that the treaty was not violated and hence now outside the party had the right to intervene. Um, the question being solely a matter of the emperor, who had granted the original promise and so could recede it. The Swedish representatives had um, endeavoured to escape the loss of the Åland Islands, the, what they called the four posts of Stockholm, as Napoleon and also, as, you know, also Napoleon described them. They were culturally, ethnically and linguistically purely Swedish, but these facts were not significant. They considered significant at the time. Mm, turns out they were also quite interesting to the British. So after the Crimean War, the, uh, Alan, the, the islands were demilitarized according to the Alan Convention, including the Treaty of Paris 1856. And during the War of the Sixth Coalition, Russian, uh, Russia and Sweden concluded an alliance directed against France, which meant they sort of became friends. And actually uh, planned a landing in Swedish Primaria, which had been overrun by the French. And as part of the agreement, Russia had promised to press Denmark to cede Norway to Sweden. Uh, although Britain never joined that particular treaty. And most of these plans were failed to materialize because Napoleon decided to invade Russia. So, the Treaty of Fredrikstrand was um, fun. You, one of the interesting things, and one of the things you will find below, is that there is a link to the original text of the treaty. Well, there should be in it. If there isn't, that's annoying. Um, there isn't. It's an interesting. It's a. It is a good example of a frequent of a treaty which would be a Russian style treaty from this period. It's not exactly a nice treaty for anyone if you're subject to it. Okay, my enemies are never stupid. Looks at the Battle of Pythia, and well, there is, is that rule of exception we all know and love. Sweden did, would get Norway for a century and further lose the bit of Pomerania it had of Vienna. It also lost Weizmar in 1813 as well, so the official death of the Swedish, uh, Sweden being a, a relevant power. Hmm, they do quite well. And soon, Sweden and Finland could be joining NATO. Well, they're apparently applying to join NATO, so that will be interesting. That's going to be problematic, but it's also... This is something, again, if I was, and this is completely going off topic for a second, but if I was the British Army, I'd be very interested in Sweden and Finland joining NATO, because, let's be honest, large British arm, Britain, Britain isn't going to produce a large armoured division unless they they change defence funding massively. But uh, a well-organised and self-sufficient British brigade that could be landed in Norway and move quickly across into Sweden and Finland, or various points or thereof, would be a pretty good force to have. A couple, of, in fact, if you could have, I don't know, a raw Marines party that would secure and carry, uh, do the high north area, but an army, a couple of army brigades which could be landed in and sent in, that'd be pretty darn useful. Sean Mac is here somewhere. That's good. Uh, it does become interesting. <laughs> Where does this really become relevant for today? Well, that's the Battle of Borodino, and that's Gustav IV being, well, being arrested. Main charge being an idiot. Mm. 
It's a very sensible charge. Hello, I'm Brew. Grand Duke Magnus Ren. My great 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 uncle was offered the throne of Finland in 1918. Turned it down. Probably sensible. But it could have been fun. How far from the Finnish border are the Russian Northern Fleet bases? Not far enough for the Russians to be really happy. Also, at what point do we reckon Finland gets some PH? That could be fun. Anyway, so... This is the kind of war which gets launched in this period especially. You have two enemies who are both led by posturing, pontificating, bombastic something or other. There are various names I can use, but I won't. And they are both trying to they're both trying to aggrandize themselves really. Now the Swedes are sensible in that they aren't planning a massive war of offensive against the Russians. They don't think they can win that, but Gustav the Fourth really as a commander party is absurd. Alexander is not much better. The only advantage Alexander has is that the Finnish halfway believe themselves that that's what's going to happen anyway. So the Finnish believe the Russians are going to take over. That's the problem for the Swedes. The Finnish aristocracy especially believe the Russians are coming and it's better to make an accommodation with them than to keep fighting them and probably get killed and be completely cut out of any solution. So there is a growing party of that in Finland. But more important than all this, it, the whole thing you can get down to is they wouldn't have had that belief if they'd been looking at the fortifications and they'd been in good repair. Because they partially get that view because they're thinking Sweden's abandoning them. They've, got not, they've not got very good troops. They've got, not got enough troops in their garrison. They've not got those garrisons in good order. They've not got those fortifications all built. They aren't providing any funding for their maintenance repair. They don't even have accurate maps. I honestly, this might be conceit or coming from a country which has the Ordnance Survey, but I cannot understand any nation not having accurate maps in this period. Because it's got to the period where you've got cartography and map making is becoming a science. It's a very popular science. And amongst the kings, and especially the educated monarchs, it's a thing they show off with. They present maps to each other of their own lands. They send ma present maps of each other's lands. It's one of the... Um, Get one of the great gifts you can give your opponent, which is something supposed to be nice. Here, I've t sent to my ordnance people, and they, here is a map of your lands presented by me. It's a kind of two-edged map uh, gift because it's here is a map of all the territory you own. Isn't it a good map? It's lovely. By the way, I now know all everything that's in your territory as well, and I know my way around just as well as you do because I have a good map. So it's sort of sort of those sort of. Very very pointed gifts you can give someone. I just can't get my head around them not having a decent, a decent map. It's absurd. It really is. Very lovely. Good evening from Finland. An interesting subject. I'm glad you... I hope you enjoyed it. <sighs> In 
In return, the Russians... They do well, but it's important to realise at no point do they really ever fight the crux of the Swedish forces. The really good troops, the really good fleet, is kept back the vast majority of the time because of Gustav IV. Because he wants to have those wars ready to invade Norway. Or fight the Danish, who might invade at any point, with their fleet, which has been sunk by the Royal Navy, in Copenhagen Round 2. I, I imagine that must have... Uh, uh, let's imagine Sir John Moore. This is the guy who will fight the Battle of Corona and various other things. Yes, let's imagine that general. Sitting there being told that he has to worry, that Gustav IV is worried about a Danish invasion force coming with their mighty fleet. When he himself has just sailed past Copenhagen, which is still by this point a smouldering, smoking wreck because of the Royal Navy. Let, let's just imagine his facial, his reaction. It would be a case of, what? What? Huh? 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 That's 10,000 troops, which would have been very useful at the beginning. Like I've talked about with World War II, the early losses matter. Uh, I'm getting into this because I'm doing the London treaties in the recording moment, but the, the, the point is, one of the big things from the, the treaty period is that there is no limitation put on sloops, the number of sloops you can carry. There is no total tonnage limitation. There is no numbers limitation on the sloop size ships. So you can build an up to 2,000 ton ship, which has a speed no more than 20 knots. It can't be designed for a speed of greater than 20 knots. Has limitations on guns. Basically, you can only fit a few four inch and three inch guns, but uh, perfectly suitable for a sloop. You can't fit torpedoes, but you can fit all the accoutrements for anti submarine warfare. Now, why the Royal Navy and British Treasury and the British government were not churning out a match build of these with their destroyers every year from 1930 onwards, I do not understand. I do understand it's they're saving money. But 2,000 tons builds you a big enough ship that you can keep modernizing and upgrading it. You could actually build it slightly less than 2,000 tons and still have space to upgrade and sort of do it. And it would keep going and going and going. And it would have been useful still in 1939 and in through World War II. As after all, most destroyers are useful for our, our, all the destroyers are useful throughout World War II. And it would have been able to do the anti submarine warfare. And if they kept building, I don't know, 16, 18 a year, which is roughly what they're building with destroyers, you'd have, pro you'd have had roughly 180 of these escorts sitting there at the beginning of World War II. You'd have had. A free, you'd have had all those vessels available for anti-submarine warfare operations. Now, if you think about that, if you think about the loss of Royal Oak, well, if the Royal Navy had more sloops wandering around, they'd have probably had more sloops wandering around providing extra security up in Scarpa Flow, even if they were reservist mans, they'd been activated by that point, uh, reserves crewed, and they could have been wandering, around, they would have been wandering around, which would have made that far more difficult. It might not have saved the Royal Oak, but it might have done. Same with the loss of HMS Glorious. It might not have saved her, but your hunting your hunting packs would have been far larger, far more numerous. You think about the early convoys. You think about the losses in the beginning of the war. In the war, you think about how you think about the crash building program you have to implement and how you have to stop carrier construction and cruiser construction and capital ship construction to make that happen. If you have 180 escorts already in service as convoy escorts. You don't need to do that. You don't need to do such a crash program. You will probably still do a program and a massive program of construction, but you don't need to. And you guess what? Here's the other thing. Because it's a limitation, you could use those same designs to build ships in Canada, to build ships in Australia, to build ships in India, in South Africa. And you could have had sloops being built all around the world for anti-submarine warfare and convoy escort and mine sweeping and all the other duties they do. And you would have been prepared for World War II far more than you were.
it's the same here. Not much work, not much effort gives him a lot more preparation. When we're talking about the Finnish war, if the money had been invested in those fortifications, if the money had been invested in having accurate maps, if the money had been invested in making sure the troops in there had adequate supplies, adequate equipment, and it was maintained to an adequate standard, the odds are this war would have not gone anywhere near as easily for the, uh, for the Russians. A, the local population would have felt far more secure and far more loyal because they felt far more committed to by the Swedish king and the Swedish monarchy and government. But B, the troops there would have felt far stronger. They wouldn't have felt abandoned. That's right, 80 sloops would be a good thing to handle over 99. It would have been 180 sloops if they matched the destroyer construction. Because it's roughly, the Royal Navy builds roughly 18 destroyers a year. So they could have had 180 by 1939. <laughs> Friend mm. Duke Macklin in Sweden. And Sweden and Russia would fight side by side just three years later. Of course, Gustav IV croaked and Bernadette became king. And well, hang on, Gustav IV was already it wasn't croaked. He'd been kicked off the throne. Charles the Thirteenth had had died. And yes, he did decide that he would rather than fight on the side of um, Napoleon, he'd side with the Britain and the Sixth Coalition and actually be mastermind behind one of the plans which destroys Napoleon. Again, Bernadette is one of the better general marshals of the Napoleonic era. You could have probably contracted something in the US. You wouldn't have needed to. That's the thing. You wouldn't have needed to. And also the other thing, if you think about it, if you're building all those sloops, guess what that does? That increases the throughput of industry and inf uh, things going through. So you're doubling your procurement of ASDICs every year. You're doubling your procurement of small ship engines. You're getting all those uh, small, more yards of experience of building ships. And because you're building water sloops are built to full warship standards, unlike corvettes, which are built to merchant ship standards, you're actually getting probably better, more useful ships for the same size and more survivable. Around Drake McLaren, it wasn't new carriers and cruisers all they cared about till the U-boats already began slaughtering merchant ships, though? Um, no. They didn't. They did seem to, they did expect the U-boat thing to happen second time around. What's often forgotten is the British, uh, I, as I've been over this from the past, and okay, one of the problems for the British is they develop ASDIC, and in the exercises they produce, they actually carry out in the Mediterranean, etc., ASDIC proves all conquering. And it's amazing in the exercises they run, Basically, ASDIC allows them to get convoys through and do great things, and they're hunting submarines with aircraft, and they have all the things going. And so it looks really good. And then war comes, and it turns out, A, they lose control. that Norway is not neutral. Norway's taken. France falls. And suddenly, their likely area of operations of submarines changes. And the sheer number of the volume of potential for submarine operations changes. And it turns out ASDIC does have a pro has problems. It has flaws. And that's the problem. And it's not new carriers and cruisers. They're also building capital ships and destroyers and sloops. And also, again, this is the point that's often forgotten, is the Royal Navy, Britain orders the flower class corvettes before war begins. They're ordered back in June 1939. They have been under design plans and ideas since 1938. 
that they're a gener they are a development and evolution of the Sloop program, which has been going in the interwar years, which has been about, about making sure the Royal Navy knows roughly how big, roughly what equipment they need in an anti-submarine warfare, a small anti-submarine warfare escort. And basically the Corvette program is about delivering that. And again, they're ordering in 1939, presuming war's not going to be coming till 1942. Because remember, that's when the 10-year the ten rule was, was informally ended in 1932, practically actually let off the hook in 1937. So theoretically, the British Navy, uh, the Royal Navy is preparing for 1942. Is it fair to say, despite how ridiculous some old history is, you can never rule out? Mm. You can find some old history, which is interesting. The problem for the Russians, though, is comes twofold from this war. They, Because of their success in this war, they feel great. They think they've managed to recover from Austerlitz, from all the other, from the battles they've lost against Napoleon. They feel they've recovered their military prowess. Uh, Alexander feels strong and powerful. And this is part of the issues which lead to what's pictured above, Borodino. Because when you have that level of ego, you think you can't be defeated. And you think that therefore the, the French won't attack you because you're now strong, you've won a war. But the French noticed that you've won the war by the skin of your teeth. That any time your logistics have been stretched, you've kind of fallen apart. And that really you won the war mostly due to the incompetence of the high command that you were fighting rather than anything else. Am I right that HMS Invincible and Dunafaka 1 Queen Mary would have been scrapped as obsolete in the 20s if they'd survived during the Model 1? Oh yeah, they'd have been gone. But they would have probably been used to count towards the tonnage the Royal Navy was claiming for, well, uh, for in the tr under the treaty system. I didn't know the flowers would develop early. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's one of the great things of history is that people don't realise quite how quickly, how early the British are actually developing quite a lot of these things. It's like ship-based radar is late 1930s, but it's starting to be deployed in roughly 1936. They're starting to look at its deployment. And, yeah, it's one of those things. If World War II doesn't happen until 1942, the Royal Navy you find fighting World War II is really different from the Navy which would have turned up in 1939. But it's as all history. You go to war with what you have. You fight battles with what you have available. You go to war with what you have. Not what you want. Not what you've got on paper and you dream of. You go to war with what you actually have. That's what you have available to fight a war. And what you have available to fight any battles is what's actually in the location of the battle. There is none of this, on paper, we have this much force, therefore on paper, that much force, that is what we will win. That does, It doesn't work out like that. What happens in any war, and this is the big problem for, in many ways, for um, the Swedish high command in this battle, is they have no understanding on paper of what they really have, let alone actually, uh, actually having any idea of what they actually have, which isn't on paper, is... What you have on paper is what you have on paper. That's only as worth the piece of paper it's on. What you have in reality is what of that, which you have on paper, is actually serviceable and able to work. And that is what you have to fight a war. And then, what you have to fight any battles in that war is what of what was serviceable and available to work is actually in the area where you're fighting the battle. Oh, and can be called upon and can be actually moved and implemented into the battle. Not going to sit on a high hill doing nothing. Vincent, Aztec was an interesting case of fitted to the four, not with scenario, where they did fit a half on the ships from what I'm reading. Aztec was more of a case of 
You fitted the ships. Uh, the, there were a, two branches of destroyers built uh, pre Aztec coming in. Then Aztec came in. And then they fitted Aztec to all the destroyers. But then they worked out, shall we fit it to battleships? Shall we fit it to the cruisers? Shall we fit it to everything? And then there's a great debate. Oh, oh, there's some people who work down and go, well, these cruisers were all fitted for Aztec, but weren't fitted with it. And there's a reason for that. At a certain point, the Royal Navy turns around and goes, hang on, fitting Aztec onto cruisers is not really sensible. We want to fit it to destroyers and sloops. And again, with corvettes, some of them would be fitted with it. But also there's a problem of where is the Aztec being made? So some of the corvettes you have built are built in, let's say some of them are built in Canada, etc. And they have access to Aztec, or some of them don't have access to Aztec, and they come to the UK and are fitted with Aztec. But there's also some British-built corvettes which go to Canada and get fitted with Aztec because there wasn't an Aztec available when they were completed here. But rather than not have a corvette in service because it hasn't got Aztec yet, they just have it do the convoy across the Atlantic and get fitted with Aztec in a Canadian yard. Because of supply. This is another reason why building all those sloops would have been useful. Because if you built those sloops, you'd have had to build up the Aztec supply to the level to sustain those sloops, which would have meant you'd have had a greater industry to draw from to build Aztec. Which would also be useful because the, the electronic industry would have been a greater basis to build radar, which would allow you to build more radar as well. So... It's one of those really annoying things of history when you look at the London treaties and you think, hang on, you could have built 180 odd sloops without much cost, without much effort for the British government, and you would have had all these ships in the service, and you didn't. And therefore, you didn't have the advantages that would have given you. Because again, it's the thing is, you can build in these advantages by doing a very slow, it's a low rate production. But it's keeping that low rate production going at sufficient volume, you can expand it. And you also always have to remember again, that one of the problems for the RN and one of the reasons why it's slightly slow with the sloop production is because, and this is the argument I think the Brit that British Royal Navy probably put, is they were limited in their funding. They weren't going to get extra funding for the sloops. And therefore, with the funding they had, they had to consider what was their most likely threat. And whilst you have Italy and Germany being annoying, you are actually pointing guns at Japan. Again, we pro uh, I would point to... Hello, you. Come oh. see my fans. Hello, okay. Hello. Hello. Anyway, so what do you come to? Have you been put down here because you're being naughty or something? No. Anyway, uh, so what the Royal Navy is doing, the Royal Navy is caught in a strategic uh, vice in many ways because the war with Japan, they don't need so the, the some anti submarine forces and the convoy escorts because Japan's the other side of the world in many respects and their major trade routes are all flowing away from Japan. And they just have to hold Singapore and they can bottle off uh they can bottle off Japan uh, bottle off Japan from the Indian Ocean and therefore they can they don't need them. So what they need what they need for a war with Japan? They need carriers, they need cruisers, they need battleships. And Italy and Germany are playing around, but they're they're being annoying and they think there's going to be a war against them. But as said, they're not pointing guns at each other. The Tsingtao incident and another incident, they've been actively pointing guns at Japan. And this is another lesson of history. Sometimes the most likely threat on paper, because that's the one who's pointing guns at you, is not the threat which goes off first. And that's why the Britain then has to almost reconfigure its forces. And whilst reconfiguring its forces, the government makes decisions of, oh, we now don't need carriers. Hang on, we do need carriers. Because that's Churchill's great idea. Let's stop capital ship and carrier construction because you don't need them to fight a war against the Germans and the Italians. Hang on, you do, because air power really matters and is really useful, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you know that, don't you? You do. You know about the importance of air power. Hello. Hello. Yes. Am I going to get the li a li lick bath? Hello. You're cute. Are you after licking me or are you after the squirrel and torpedo behind me? I think you're licking me to get to the squirrel and torpedo behind me. I think you are. You're very cute. Yes, you are. Hello. Anyway. Um, 
So that's the problem. And then sort of the, the Royal Navy is now reconfiguring itself by 19, in 1939, 19, sort of late 1939, especially with Church of Judge, 1940. And then they sort of realize, hang on, we do need those ships. They start rebuilding them. And that's the trouble with 4C and etc. When you have all those scenar that scenario, if you hadn't had the stoppage in carrier construction, you'd have had more carriers in the service. If you'd have you'd have had if you'd had those carriers available, you'd have had a carrier of four C. If you'd had a carrier of four C, then that changes the entirety of four C's operations because then they do have organic air power. They do have the capability to break up the strikes coming in. And if you can break up the strikes coming in, then the odds are the Japanese don't get the don't get the victory of sinking those two capital ships, which slows down the Japanese forces in that area, it was more time for naval forces to form up around the command. You have Admiral Phillips, you have his proper staff. Admiral Phillips is not the most stupid general, admiral in the world. He's a fairly decent admiral. So if you give him the, if he's got a carry, if he's got fast, some fast cavalry ships, he's got to, gets to form, sort of form all those forces around him. He can form an actual proper capital group. Yes, the Japanese can go south of the Kido Batai, but that's going to take time after Pearl Harbor to reorders. And while they're doing that, then they also have to deal with the a formation of American forces and the American carrier operations. And that becomes a problem. And that could well have caused far more issues for Japan and Southeast Asia. Would 4C have continued to operate from Singapore? Well, that depends. Did they manage to retain control of Singapore? Again, if you have carrier and couple of battleships operating in the support of land forces in fighting in Malaysia, that can change things. History can change very easily. History spins on a dime. A couple of different decisions can change an entire world. And if we go back to it, okay, so again, if you go back to that Corvette decision, build those all those sloops, which you could do under the treaties, you might not lose Glorious, you might not lose Royal Oak. Going back? Okay. You go and just go sniff. Take care, hon. Love you all. But I'm off for my tea. Midnight snack, actually. Mmm. Oh. Very nice. Thank you for putting your effort, time and effort into this entertaining and informative live stream. I'm glad it's helpful. Anyway, um, so if you have the sloops, you, as I said, Royal Oak might not be lost, Glorious might be lost. You don't have to do the crash building program, which means you might well keep the carriers in construction. Churchill is only persuaded by the need, the absolute need for for small ships that he's sought to carriers. He's prepared to keep them going instead of the capital ships, because the capital ships, he doesn't trust the 14-inch guns of the King George V. He doesn't think they're big enough. So if you had that going... If you had the six, if you had the carriers, you'd have then had car uh, fast carriers, and you could have had glorious in service in some place, which would freed up a carrier. You could have had, uh, which also might have saved courageous, because if you'd had glorious and courageous as part of the Norway campaign, then the other, they might well have been operating as a pair. If they're operating as a pair, they might have had a rear admiral with them, which might have changed again the whole scenario versus the Shan Horse and uh, Nice now, because they could well have had aircraft operating. Because there could well have been an admiral going, excuse me, Captain, you're being an idiot. You keep aircraft airborne so we know what the uh, what anyone everyone's doing scenario. Um, you could also have had, you know, you can basically go on. The butterflies build up. And it's all from a simple change in history. One change. Not a massive change. No change in governments. No change in anything. Just a construction program with sloops. Anyway. And it's the same here. If Gustav IV had taken his actual concept of operations, which he has, this is his concept of operations, and he'd actually gone, right then, in order to do phase one, I need to make sure those fortifications are held by proper garrisons, properly supplied with food, and have all the necessary troops in them. And by the way, I have five months to achieve this, even if I hadn't been doing it normally. He could have changed the, uh, the fate of the war. Mm. Right. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Um, what have we got coming up? Uh, you're going to enjoy some of you next week because the 17th of May is the Galaxy class. And 
There's a reason I haven't listed the brew ships for the 22nd of May, because again, that will be turned into the Galaxy Class Live, if people would like that to be. Brew ships 80 is going to be new books. That's this Sunday. And then we have Patron 54 and Patron 53 and Patrons 54. Uh, wedding week, as said, is that week. And basically from the 27th onwards, I am on wedding duties. So to um, CB, I will be reporting for duty. She knows what her nickname means. Anyway, uh, on the 27th, and I'll be there 27th, 28th. If I'm still awake, I'll be up on the 29th to talk to you all. And yeah, that's going to be fun. Plus, starting. We have a recorded video which will be coming out on the 31st of May, which is the SMS Admiral Spron and the Novara class, the Austro-Hungarian Navy. Uh, then 2nd of June, we have the Equitable Washington Treaty. 4th of June, we have the Equitable Washington Treaty, overall Equitable Treaty. Those have all been recorded and uploaded. 3rd of June, we have a UAD video, which is cruisers of the Equitable Washington Treaty, other ships, what could be built on the Equitable Limits. And also me answering some questions from some other videos. And then, yeah. Always going on. So, I hope you're going to enjoy them all. And, yeah. And all I will say is, I'm really looking forward to the dinners on the 3rd and the 4th of June. No, I'm really looking forward to the dinners on, yeah, on the 3rd and 4th of June. Take care. Hope everyone's having fun, and uh, thank you for watching. Night. And while I remember, Thank you, Glenn Stewart. Thank you, Grand Duke. Uh, th thank you, Grand Troop. Thank you, Derp Squad. Thank you, Shirt Max, uh, Sean Max, Stafford, Dan, and Paul from Chicago for all your admining. Thank you, Night Six Eight Three One, Derp Squad, Darius Ratsky, Karma Gasberg, Sage, and everyone else for DGV Forty for watching and chatting away uh, and answering question, asking questions. It's been really cool. Thank you. Uh, George Newman, thank you Seneca Nero, thank you everyone who supports the channel, thank you everyone who's a patron, thank you to everyone who's a subscriber, thank you to everyone who just, you know, hangs out here, it's really fun, and I hope you enjoy the stuff, and I hope you keep enjoying them, and I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the Finnish War, because it was very much an introduction, trust me, there are more details I could have gone into, but there's only so much you can do in a little over three hours. Take care everyone, thank you for watching, and um, have a nice evening. And again, this is a message that both me and Drac, uh, uh, both me and Drac are sort of saying, we're on these ships. The only one which you can't be on while I'm on is the third on the uh, visit, to uh, scout, uh, visit to Scouts of Hyder on the third of Friday in the morning, which then when it's not open to public. Otherwise, we're going in on days when they're open. And so, if people turn up and want to ask us questions while wandering around. As long as you don't mind us answering after we've done our filming. So if we're filming, we'll just you'll see because we'll be talking to the camera. Then when we turn off the camera, we're more than happy to answer questions. And again, yeah, we're more than happy to meet up and do things. Uh, I know I've been working with Wayne Boring and a few others on organising some of the speaker events. And let's if they happen, they happen. That's great. If they don't happen, and if you just want to organise more dinners or chat with us, we're more than happy. We're really looking forward to it, and we love. Let's put it this way, this is the first time I've got to visit Canada as a tourist, and I'm really looking forward to it. I am going to be doing some touristy stuff. This is why Niagara Falls is sitting there. I want to actually get to Niagara Falls this time. It's I'm, I'm going to get there. Even if I have to drag drag. No, I won't have to drag. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. And thank you, Matthias Salavik, Derp Squad, Fisherman, Paul Ennis, David Hunt. Thank you, everyone. And Andrew Ben, thank you. Take care.